Welcome to the Independent Characters, episode 207. And this episode, we will be talking about Rogue Trader, the role-playing game. This is a game produced by Fantasy Flight Studios over 10 years ago now, uh, which, wow, I didn't realize it had been that long. I'm joined by Jody, Adon, and Josh. Hey, guys. Hey. Hello. Howdy. We are all remote, uh, still in our shelter-in-place situation here in California or Arizona, as the case may be, Adon. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so again, I apologize that this show has taken so long to come out. Uh, we are trying to get back on track here. Just we got a lot going on and there's a you, lot going on. You would think things would line up easier and they just are proving not to be the case. So, um, yeah. And we had to not only not only did we have to schedule to record, we had to schedule to play Rogue Trader so that we knew what the hell we were talking about in this whole episode. Um, and I think we've done it justice. I think uh, I think we've done it justice. So uh, I think you are in for a treat. I'd like to say that this show is sponsored by our Patreon member, Jonathan Newberry. Thank you so much for your support. If you are interested in joining our Patreon, you can find more information about that at theindependentcharacters.com. There's a link there to our Patreon. So this episode, as I mentioned, we are going to be covering uh, Rogue Trader, which is a role-playing game put out by Fantasy Flight Studios. It is no longer in print. You can sometimes find these books on eBay and that kind of thing, but um, you can also get the PDF versions of these at Drive Through RPG, and I'll provide a link in the show notes to the Rogue Trader uh, books. And it is one in a series of um, five games that were put out, all using a very, very similar system, if not identical in some cases, uh, which consisted of Dark Heresy, Rogue Trader, Death Watch, Only War and Black Crusade, all of those kind of looking at different aspects of the 40K universe at that time. Cool. Let's launch right into Elite Choice. I'll go last, actually, since I've just talked so much. And Josh, let's start with you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so my Elite Choice was from uh, about a week ago now, and this was Max Skelkrot. Uh, and this was a pretty awesome post. It really uh, touched my heart. <laughs> and that this... Uh, <laughs> The Max and a gang of about 20 local players came together and donated, built, painted, etc. an army, a Necron army for a player in their area whose apartment complex had burned down. So it lost everything, lost all the models, all that. They, you know, everybody was safe and said they're financially stable. And so the one thing that the community could really do to help them recover from this situation is, you know, give them something to look forward to, something positive and, it's a gorgeous uh, Necron army that it really is about 20 people came together and yeah, painted, sculpted and painted. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, our contributed funds towards, and uh, it's, it's just pretty incredible and speaks volumes to, you know, how, how great our community can be. Nice. Really just, yeah, it's beautiful together. looking army. Yeah. yeah it's <laughs> great. And I also wanted to give a shout out to showcase comics and games in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, because they really helped out with big discounts. Uh, for the app, for the oh nice parts of it yeah very so nice. So just want to give them a shout out. Cool, Jody. Yeah, mine's a little bit of a, a reparation for uh, something that happened here. I thought I had shouted this out before, but thankfully Isaiah Gittens, uh, back on June fourteenth, posted a group of pictures actually kind of bringing together a large project he put together, where he converted prior to the release of the Chaos Knights proper kit mm -hmm. uh, for 40 k scale being put out he'd converted up in a very kind of blanchitsu style yeah. his own trio of of chaos knights and he had some really a friend of his took some photos some really nice kind of focused in and, and detail shot photos and put together some collages with them and he reposted that into the the facebook group and man they, it's just a beautiful They're project amazing. Uh, i dialogued with him a little bit when he was originally doing the work in progress shots so if you uh, do the search for hashtag elite choice you can find his um, but then if you search his name you can go back and actually see the work in progress carl a while back you called out he did an angrog and mm -hmm. conversion more recently that was just fantastic um but isaiah's got a really unique conversion style that i really really like and i don't remember what happened that i'd intended to call this one out back when he was originally working on it and uh and seeing him come across my screen again i thought you know these are just just outstanding so i wanted to to acknowledge them again they are they are Cool. Really unique and just fantastic. Yeah, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. This is actually on my short list. I had a short list of selections, and this was definitely 
on my short list. When who, I saw you, who was, was the like, top of oh, your list? I can cross that one. Huh? <laughs> who was the top of your list? Yeah. So, well, one of the things about the shelter in place thing it was really cool to see so many because so many families are all home together. You're seeing a lot more of kids with their yeah gamer parents, yeah, painting and playing and all this kind of stuff and and Lego. Uh, Lego warriors beating space Marines. I mean, all kinds of really cool stuff. And so that was, that's really fun to see that stuff. And um, so I just wanted to comment on that, but I think for me, even though it wasn't technically posted by the originator in mm -hmm. our group, I want to give uh, games workshop uh, my shout out for this time in the war of the spider. They have a little, a little uh, illustration in the book and if you didn't know what it was, you just go right by it because it's just like one of the small illustrations of the book. But they actually call out Jeff Robinson, mm -hmm. um, who recently passed. And so it was a little tribute to him with this little uh, – it's it's how they do that, the imperial, you know, transmissions that come across with little plus signs and stuff like yeah. that under a under a, a graphic. And it was just kind of really cool to see them do that. He made They made him a shield captain. Nice. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I just – it just – I thought it was really nice for them to – That is to kind of call out somebody who had really worked with them to, to, I mean, he really helped them with their outward facing community for sure drives. Mm -hmm. And, um, anyway, that's, yeah. that's what I picked. Oh, good one. Good one. Fantastic. And I chose David Moss's, uh, incredible bounty hunting crew made of various bits. The thing I really loved about this, uh, particular project was that he just kind of went through his bits box and put together a very Blanchitsu looking kind of, yeah. uh kill team if you will uh that it, it just worked for me it, it resonated on a bunch of levels and uh, i thought it looked like a lot of fun and it looked unique and it's unlike something you'll see anywhere else so really enjoyed uh looking at this thing and and i think it's just an awesome piece of work awesome piece yeah. of work so you definitely uh nailed it on the head there i know i've called out david in the past <laughs> for blanjutsu style conversions and just knocking it out of the park and yeah you, this is nothing nothing shy of another amazing endeavor in that so yeah, yeah i wonder if david's at the point of okay we get it you're really good you might be getting uh jeremy wooded here soon that the, you might get the wood treatment <laughs> it's, it's another okay good you're really good at this we're all very the, very elite impressed. choice hall of fame is what there we'll it call is. it well him, him and, and will Hahn and eric beers those guys are just like maybe i should up, always end up in my top you know my short list i'm like no i can't call these guys out again i should put okay. something up there like in the independent characters page that's like the hall of fame and these people no longer get mentioned for this stuff they're just there look on the community but we can we can point people search for their name because yeah. there's awesome stuff and we yeah, can just exactly. point people to hall of fame every time yeah. i think that's what i'll do yeah because so. eric's latest stuff was awesome too right I mean, oh, oh my dude God, i don't even want to talk yeah. it's, you know what i hate yeah <laughs> hate all these you know guys. if he was if he wasn't such a jerk <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah great group of people Anyway, yeah. you know what? Let's do this. Let's uh, take a short break and then just launch right into the show. So we'll be right back. Matt here to welcome you into 2020 and tell you about an amazing new offer from Table War. All returning customers receive an extra 10% off Table War's U.S. web store. Need a tower case? 10% off. Need a new fat mat? 10% off. Need a macro mat, geo mat, or just some accessories? All 10% off. This offer starts January 1st and will continue on throughout 2020. No coupon required. Just ensure you have an account and this discount is automatic. This is our way of saying thank you to all of our loyal customers. So visit us today at TableWar.com. Table War. Table War is a registered trademark of Table War Designs, Inc. All rights reserved. All right, and let's kick it off with a little bit of hobby progress. I'll go first because mine's going to be super short. <laughs> <laughs> I have literally no hobby progress. Like I have not, uh, I've not painted anything. I've not uh, uh, done anything dramatic. Um, yeah, I've, I've kind of done nothing. Like the one thing I did think about doing was uh, painting this giant Cthulhu thing just because we've been doing so much <laughs> right. Cthulhu stuff. But um, no, I mean, work has kept me busy. We've got, you know, various... Um, scheduled games that we're doing you know every few nights and stuff and i just nothing but you did you did 3 3d print some uh some terrain uh yeah well those are dice towers for role playing games <laughs> no 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 you did that other the stl that i sent over oh to okay you. yeah i i 3d printed one oh, he's reaching over to get it one 
Oh, only piece. one. You only did the one? Yeah. I, oh, I want to talk to you about these because these are, they're not very inspired. <laughs> no. I mean, if you they want were, them, were, cool. They cheap. I'll print them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, like when I compare it to some of the the models I have printed, um, it's super, super basic. Uh, and right. Yeah, I mean, like some of the details lacking on it and stuff. It's all right. If you want it, you know, we'll print it. Well, but. the idea is that it's supposed to be part of a big long wall, so you don't need a whole lot of detail for that, you um, know. And it was inexpensive. Yeah, and yeah, I'm just like, saying, like, okay, there's better options out there. But I'm sure. Yeah, you know, I'm sure. I'm happy to do these for you. Uh, but yeah, before I printed more, I wanted you to see this one and uh, kind of decide. Yeah, is this what you really want? Because it's a lot okay. of hours you're talking about printing. So. Right. 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 Anyway, yeah, that's literally all I've done. So let's go to Josh and see what exciting stuff he's done. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I did have about a two-month dry spell of not doing much of anything, uh, just at the kind of the start of Shelter in Place, mm -hmm. uh, or since the last episode I was on, which I think was two episodes ago. Um, but I, I did actually, I picked up a Kalexis Assassin, and I just wanted to paint a single miniature. Like, I just kind of re reset my mechanism. Um and I, I got the miniature, I built it, and then I just kind of triggered a building spree. Reflex. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. But, and part of that was because the the ninth edition box set, like the the teaser of what's going to be in that. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. It's all the assault things that I can finally feel good about adding Primaris to my Shark Sharkadon army because right. they are an assault army first and foremost. So having a super shooty Primaris army has just never felt right thematically. So knowing that that stuff's coming, I'm like, okay, I'm finally going to kind of get the ball rolling on Primera sizing the Shark Sharkadons. Um, so with that, I built three more aggressors, which I, I built three maybe a year ago, and I just kind of had sat there. So I built the other three of those. Uh, I built 10 intercessors, and those are just standard um, bolter intercessors just to right. you know, round out troop options. Um Primaris Ancient and the two Primaris Lieutenants. And that's all from the, uh, whatever that box set is, not the Shadow Spear, but the one that came out before that. Right. Dark, Dark Imperium. Dark Imperium, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that, those are all just the, those models. I've got all the characters and things like that. But I'm actually, I'm really excited for the the new models coming out with the, oh, yeah. the Assault Intercessor specifically. That new Chaplain model, I absolutely love. Oh, yeah. oh, even so more good. so than the existing oh, one. Oh, he's so good. Yeah, I'm like, all right, I'll put that on hold. So that that being said, I actually bought a box of Reavers, Primaris Reavers, because they're going to fit the shark theme super well. Again, just being stealthy, assaulty. Yep. I know they're not necessarily the best unit on the table, but they look gorgeous and they're going to fit the theme really well. So right. I'm really excited for those. Um, on the painting front, I busted out in just a couple of days, actually, the Palantine Enforcers, the, the, 10, the base 10 model um, gang for Necromunda start to finish i started those on friday and actually you just busted uh, them out in a couple of days i started them yeah, friday yeah. and then i uh, finished them uh, i put the the varnish on yesterday so yeah, yeah you sure. turned and burned on those things man yeah. that was amazing and i'm yeah real real happy with how they looked out uh or turned out i've got the uh subjugators which i can give you a little sneaky peek of here uh work in progress uh, i love those guys with the shields for sure yeah yeah, I'm super excited to get those guys done so i've got those six base coated and then i'm working on two ambots as well nice uh, all, all that stuff being necromunda and uh can't wait to play games again but yeah, yeah. but it, it it i mean i had it was literally a two month dry spell of doing nothing because it just wasn't motivation to get it yeah i think you and i were talking about that the other day when you were hobbying and i just hung out with you online and and how i just um i feel like you know if i have something that i am working towards i i feel more motivated but right now i just yeah. feel like eh, you know I'll, I'll get yeah, to it. I, I just, I'm not feeling a drive right now to get any. It really seems like all of us are kind of like in this, I haven't really done anything in a while <laughs> mode. And I just, it's interesting the psychology behind it. Well, as it turns out, my wife's making a ton of noise in the other room, but other than that, um, you know, as it turns out, it's, it's one of those things where, um, where, uh, you know, th it was always the, well, I don't have time to do the painting. turns out that wasn't really the problem. Right. <laughs> no, me. that's, that has been validating for a long time. I've been pretty vocal about when people go, Oh, I don't have time to paint. And my favorite example for us in Santa Cruz, we just point at Brian and we're like, this guy gets yeah. it done. So I'm not sure what your excuse yeah. is for yeah. two toddlers. Um, 
you know, I think that's always, I agree with you, Adon, 100%. The psychology of why you are or are not painting is I also, it was funny, actually, I found myself wondering, this might be a record for me of the longest I've gone without painting uh, mm-hmm. in, longest dry spell is certainly in a num a significant number of years possibly within a decade this is the longest i've gone without doing any meaningful mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. gw related painting um i finished up the core of the blitz bowl teams but i think that was on the last time i was on the show yeah, i had that right. finished and literally haven't painted a single gw anything since uh but i took the advice that we often give is to clear the mechanism so once i got i am officially to teacher summer now first week fully in here uh and and have been just literally cleaning things up so yeah. hopefully getting to a point where i can you know have that clear mental space but carl like you were saying if usually I don't need to be playing, but, but the total lack of play and like the lack of it being a foreseeable, like we're still at a point here, right. at least in my household that, you know, we're not sure when we're really going to be looking yeah, at, yeah. at hanging out and pushing models around for an afternoon is, is super viable. Right. Um, that, that, you know, it's just no super motivation to get that going. I did make one purchase and I usually am pretty loath to avoid purchases, but this has been on my wish list for quite a while. Um, and there was a cool sale. So I took advantage. I'll, I'll do mine real quick here. Battlefront that handles uh, Gale Force 9 products. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. had their various terrain sets. They had bundles where if you bought basically one piece from each theme so you got whatever they had for that theme and you bought it all at once you got a really pretty decent deal and the shipping was super reasonable for for being overseas shipping um so i did pick up what's effectively their gothic ruins set um they're i've always liked them because it's the resin right they're they're, They're resin and they're a heavy duty like yeah yeah it's nice stuff almost porcelain-y kind of like like they're they're really robust yeah um and they come fully painted Philippe, it's done. You, it's you. They used to come with these like really aggressive fitting. Uh, what are the comic book statues? If you're into comic book, yeah, really high end. The the foam that they pack those in is super custom designed. Right. I'm glad they actually don't come that way anymore because it was too hard to get them in and out of the box. But they come with a box. You drop them in the box. You take them out of the box. There's yeah, some bubble nice. wrap on them. Hit the table. They have felt bottoms. They're felt lined on the bottom. Um, nice. They're really a quality product. And at the price, when they had the sale going uh, at the at that price, I couldn't say no. Um, it's, a, hope... it's a good thing I didn't see that that sale going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, you're kind of going. How come you didn't tell me? You know, <laughs> uh, it was well. It was of, through the independent characters community page. Of course, Somebody it posted was. It there, and I ah, okay. Yeah. Of, of, uh, speaking of those statues, those comic statues, did you see the unboxing of the company that has? Put together oh, okay. the uh, the um, McFarlane. No, no, no. The oh, the, the uh, uh, Gilliman Gilliman and the Chaos oh, Space Marine. Yes, the huge statue. It's like yeah, it was a thousand dollars to buy this thing. Uh, when it came out, like I was at first when I saw it, I was like, I'm totally gonna buy that. And then it was a thousand dollars, and I was like, where am yeah, I I'm really gonna it. put this thing? And yeah. Put nah, it next to I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with my my hundred dollar investment here of the action figure. Which, I, got hey, that, I, I got the action figure. I got that one up. too. Uh, it, but it counts. I um I I I bagged off of of buying it, and then I saw the unboxing of that thing, and I was like, oh, I should have bought that. I should have bought that. And I even went and looked, and they only had 999 of them. Of course, they're all sold. It was just like, right? Oh, I really should have bought that. <laughs> so. Too yeah, late. Wow, the detail on those are pretty, pretty impressive. I don't even know where I'd put even that more thing, so in person, but, but it yeah. was awesome. It yeah, was I'd awesome. completely missed that that even happened. That thing is gorgeous. What yeah. an amazing piece. But yeah, I mean, and it's it, huge. <laughs> they're very proud of it, too. Right? Oh, they should be. I think it's <laughs> awesome. Be, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, if you spend a thousand dollars for something, you should be proud of you it. You should be really, really happy yeah. with it. And you actually have to assemble it like in in all these different pieces and that's pretty together. common on those anymore yeah yeah uh, it, it's uh the guy who just the why hero quest is the best game yeah. ever yeah, video yeah. the the bard uh he actually in his channel he reviews like fantasy statues that are those really deluxe high-end ones and i was surprised to see that that's pretty common anymore yeah still. yeah anyway yeah. which not to sense. get sidetracked let's go to uh let's go to a don yeah, um, so I had talked about that control tower thing I was building for the spaceport before, and I was waiting for some final pieces. They came in. Mark from Lasercraft Models was really cool about it. So I got that put together. It's ready to go. It's ready to paint. I'm not going to paint it until I'm ready to paint a bunch of the other stuff. Mm-hmm. 
for that project because I want to kind of do it all at the same time. And I'm waiting for, there's a company that makes the, the two little mini landing pads I want to put on the sides of the table. And nice. they're not up and running yet because they can't get the MDF. So I've been in contact with them and they just, they're just not uh, producing things at the, at the moment. And so when they get back up and running, I'll be buying a couple of those things. And then I'll have the vast majority of the stuff I need to kind of get the basics for, um, for that kind mm -hmm. of layout. And then I got to figure out, I had some really good suggestions from folks about how to use PVC and those kinds of things to kind of suspend the center forge world tile up on the, like the third level because it's supposed to be it's supposed to be kind of a takeoff of the Lionsgate spaceport. So, um, but I, I'm feeling pretty good about that. That's ready to go. So that was kind of cool. Um, I got my um, my Adepticon Vig bag mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the mail. In fact, I'm wearing my Adepticon shirt right now. Yeah, I got mine as well. Um, I got mine yeah. as well. And um, you know, that's got the Lexicon Varus uh, Primaris Librarian and Terminator armor. Yes, it does. Really cool uh, model. I, I probably won't end up using it, but it, it's a neat model. Um, but it came with, it also there was a paint rack, uh, an MDF paint rack in mm -hmm. there. I assembled that and I had bought two other ones from an Etsy shop that actually has like Imperial Eagle style cutouts on the back. And so I had bought those two for my contrast paint. So I put those, I assembled that. So all my contrasts are now nicely contained in that. I had had them on this little shelf thing that they were very kind of precarious. So now I, I feel good about that. I kind of been using the contrast a little bit more, a lot more. Um, I ended up with two of the Catechin kernels. Yeah. You said that <laughs> you said, Hey, you uh, want to buy one of these? I got no use for that guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of them, I, yeah. So I, I just ended up with two. I didn't really expect to have to get one. And then I ended up with two. So, um, I was able to so trade you cut one. one up for bits. <laughs> what there you go oh yeah no but um yeah so i traded one with uh my buddy anthony who used to be one of the owners of endgame yeah and he because he i trade models for painting <laughs> ah, it so for you. yeah i'm gonna do that and then um the other thing that was in that bag though was uh an age of sigmar style journal yeah it's a cool like the, it's a cool one yeah and so i'm gonna use that as my age of sigmar version of the the uh, you know the tome of grudges that I use for 40k. Yeah. So I spent a bunch of time printing out photos from my Age of Sigmar games so I could put that in there. Nice. Um, now you're like scrap. You're scrapbooking. Yeah. Age of exactly. Sigmar scrapbooking. <laughs> it's a gaming scrapbook. Well, I already it. have a 40k one. <laughs> so can you know, we get across, across the streams of hobby? People. Yeah. <laughs> you know when I'm when I have a game, I write down the information from the game, and then I take pictures, right? And then I print one of them out and put it in there. That's so, awesome. Yeah. I yeah. think that's I think that's really cool. It's fun. Yeah, yeah to for be sure. able to look back over it and kind of oh right, that's where I get my butt kicked by that guy. Um <laughs> so <laughs> um most of my painting has been Age of Sigmar stuff. Mm -hmm. Um where uh Seraphon, I my whole my new army twenty twenty, new new year new army was uh Seraphon. Mm -hmm. So I've been painting a, a bunch of that stuff with uh contrast. Um, but most recently was paying a bunch of Stormcast Eternal stuff for um, a an upcoming episode of a different podcast, which has been delayed again. Because hey, look, uh, I'm, who am I to cast stones at this point? This this well, episode is like a month late. <laughs> We've with, been so uh, <laughs> Arizona is one of the, like the top three states spiking in cases. Yep, and um, so it's really kind of dicey with us taking care of ah. my. In-laws were in their 80s sure, sure. You know, to be bringing folks in and, and recording stuff and playing again. Because the whole idea was we're going to do a four-person game and then record it afterwards. Yeah, don't do that. Like, you know what? I can't. No, we can't do that right now. <clears throat> nope. Yeah, for sure. So, but, you know, in the meantime, uh, Anthony gave me this really cool little tutorial on how to paint the paint scheme that he was doing for my guys, yeah. but in an easy contrast method because yeah. Anthony's one of those guys who does 17 layers with 15 highlights and four washes and all that stuff. And that's not me. Um, but, uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you guys about that I kind of basically came to the conclusion finally was that, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time and a lot of money, a lot of money on classes and on equipment and on techniques and done a lot of different types of models. And I just do not like painting. <laughs> it, it doesn't interest me. I'm not good at it. I think it's fair. I, Look, yeah, you've, you've I don't tried enjoy it. You've... When I'm doing it, it just stresses me out. 
I don't like golf. I've gone and played a lot of golf. And I'm yeah, like, I don't like you this know, game. Why am I yeah, doing but this? Golf isn't one of your primary hobbies. Well, you're damn right. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> But what I'm saying is I, I it. love I I'm love firing himself from the hobby. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I love I love playing with fully painted armies. I do. Yeah. And I think it looks yep. great on the table. Have and I the I, solution for you? <laughs> well, no, and I have had a bunch of stuff commissioned I know. Me, as you all as you all know. But it's interesting because I, I get I do get uh regular pushback. You know, you get the gatekeepers are like, oh, well, you're not really you're not really a hobbyist then. You're not really a you're not really a war gamer because you don't actually do it all. So, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of sticks to my head. And so who's, who's I, giving you that grief? Uh, I'm not going to call them out on a podcast, but yeah, the, uh, but you know, so I just, when it, when that starts to bother me, I, I'll sit down and put some more, contrast you know, paint you on know what I tell people to give me, give me that crap. So let's play a game. I got a fully painted army. <laughs> I don't really care <laughs> yeah, what right. you think. <laughs> I the don't really care. I'm so yeah. over that. I don't, yeah. I don't care. I, I need to get over that. I need to finally just say, you know what? I Adon, it's you're, okay that you're, I don't enjoy painting. You're a big boy. Okay. So, Stop worrying yeah. about what other people care about. Is it it's well, it's it's all about it's your hobby, right? No, How I are get you that. enjoying your hobby? But I do I do wish that I was okay at it and that I actually enjoyed it. Right? Sure. And what's funny is that when I sit down to paint, I'll look up and it'll be like two and a half hours later. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I also realized that during that whole time I've been stressed and, and yeah, this is not supposed to and, be stressful. Right. Right. Yeah. So, and I, I kind of finally came to this, I put down my paintbrush the other day while I was painting this stormcast guys going, you know what? I just do not like this. So don't do it. So, man. Like yeah. that's, I, I, yeah. I, I, I genuinely do not think if, if you do not like a part of this hobby, whether it's assembly, whether it's the lore, if you only like playing tournament, you know, do what you enjoy, man. Right, you know, don't yeah, worry yeah. about the rest there, of it. There, there's so many facets to being a part of this hobby that if right. you're not participating in one of the seven, eight, however many you want to yeah. count up there, like you're still an active participant and you're enjoying the hobby. Like you're still dude. Look hobby. how many events you've thrown and that kind of thing. Like that's where your right. enjoyment from the hobby comes from. Just focus on the things you enjoy. And I think it's sure, a valid right, right, right. point, Adon. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, I've spent. It's not like I haven't tried, right? I've spent spent a yeah. ton of money yeah. i've yeah. traveled to a bunch of classes yep. i have a bunch of equipment that i've used over and over yep and that's you know, fair I, I think I look like, dude, you know, yeah well good for you congratulations on on reaching that threshold of this part is not my jam not you know, everybody's I mean, the renaissance so you want to paint my stuff for me no <laughs> uh, no i don't <laughs> but i we know lots of people who, oh i know i do too yeah <laughs> But, uh, you know, that's tournament gaming, like competitive gaming. I understand it. I tried it. It's not for me. Yeah. I'm right? and, but that doesn't mean cool. it's bad. It's just no, that part it's not of my the hobby thing. I don't no. enjoy. I, I have to say, you know, it's just, and we've, I mean, ad nauseum, but <laughs> I, I can't tell you how much I really enjoy walking into that huge auditorium at Las Vegas Open and seeing 270 gamers rolling dice and playing games and, you know, they're into it and it's like, this is really cool watching this many people enjoying, you know, the, the, the same hobby, style their way. Of hobby that I mm-hmm. like tangentially through the way that I like it. But it's still really cool to watch them enjoying it and see people involved in it. I love it. I love sure. it. I wouldn't necessarily do it, but I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can I, let that go, man. I like, enjoy okay. watching people enjoy themselves. Right. right. Yeah, and, exactly. And and if they're enjoying it and something that I'm a part of, even the better. Right. So right, right. I, I, seriously, anyway. I don't think you should worry about this. I think you should be like, you know what? I'm going to send these to paintedfigs.com and get them painted. That's <laughs> that's it. And, and I've said a hundred times, you know, the only thing you can't get back is time. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've had that discussion actually with, with John French recently. We were, yeah. we have a call every couple of weeks where we just get together and chat and, and we're both on the same page there, you know. Yeah. I'm getting the outside of my house painted. I'm not painting that. Do I? Am I not a homeowner? <laughs> you know, because right. I didn't paint my house. <laughs> no, all right, right, right. So I, li- I also, so I listened to uh, Damocles by Phil Kelly. And by the way, and- Colin's doing a great job with his airbrush on my house. I just wanted to. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is he using the so tower though? Yeah, like, yeah, it's a workhorse. Okay, it's a yeah. workhorse. <laughs> Um, I listened to Blade of Damocles by Phil Kelly. Now, this is not the Space Marines Battles book yeah. called Damocles. This is Blades of Damocles. This is the one where um, the Space Marines are, fu- the Ultramarines are fighting against the Tau. Yeah. 
and uh, you really get a, uh, the whole idea between Farsight and uh, the other the other one, uh, Farsight and. The other I one. Can, yeah, the other I towel can, guy. Shadow, shadow Spear? Shadow, shadow, shadow Sun. Sun. Shadow Sun. That's it. Shadow yeah. Sun. yeah. Um, and so it, it was kind of cool. It was kind of, I, I hadn't read that yet. And so I went through that one. Um, one thing that kind of struck me about it was the Tau were using these different colloquialisms that were very, that I took as very human. That it's like, why would they say that? You know, like, that's rad, want, not this, dude. Not this one, but, you know, something like the Kick apple the doesn't fall. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I mean, right, which one, is... Something like that. Yeah. I thought, eh, eh, okay. Um, but, no, overall, I really liked it, and I liked the idea where it showed the tension between the different mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. casts and stuff like that. So I, I found it interesting. And then I also did uh, The Regent's Shadow by Chris Raitt, which is part of the Watchers of the Throne series. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Is that the first, about the first one? What? This is is that the first one? one? Second one. Second one. Yeah, so, this is the, so there's a, a custode... Yep. A sister of silence, and in this one, there's the uh, the lead chancellor of, uh, mm -hmm. of the of the council, mm -hmm. and um, again, really cool story. I liked what they did in that in that book. Is every uh, chapter it changes to the different point of view of, a, of of one of the three characters. So each chapter it rotates back through, and it's all the same story, but they're coming at it from different angles. So I thought that was really interesting. He. Um, you know, you talk about cord like an apple mm -hmm. in the book. That's you were Steve, reading. Steve Parker. Yeah. Yeah. So Chris had one that he had a phrase that he used in, in this that came up a lot as something like the, their mind clicked over. He watched their mind click over, their oh, mind yeah, yeah. clicked over on it. And it, it, when the third time I heard it, I was like, okay, that's yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I got to tell that, you, that, uh, Chris is, is one of my favorite authors and yeah, he is honestly like one of the most gentlemanly guy you will ever meet like he is so pleasant and nice and and everything i did not care for the series oh I, is that right i really struggled through the first book and then i just decided okay maybe this is not the series for me i i like the second book yeah um that's good i liked i like the um uh, kind of the the point of view of the custode and him looking at well anyway the whole situation you're seeing it from three completely different views yeah, yeah. and you get you get a sense of a larger picture that none of them see. And it was, I thought it was really well done. Yeah. Um, He's a that, talented think, writer, man. Yeah. I, I, I enjoyed it. So anyway, that's me. Cool. Not to piggyback or jump. Uh, I also finished Talon of Horus. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, hey. that's right. Yeah. And, and it what it turns out it's good. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I know that my Spoiler. opinion <laughs> on something when I say, Hey, I like this is minimized because I like so much. <laughs> you like I, everything. <laughs> I get that. I get that. But when I super double down on something, <laughs> double dog dare you. I <laughs> really mean it. Um, look, because I can admit, like, uh, oh man, I'm gonna catch so much heat. Don't, don't even go there. <laughs> yes, Justice League Martha? is a terrible movie. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. I liked seeing those icons on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, for me, okay, that was enough. I have rewatched it and gone, yeah, this is a broken and terrible movie at this hey, point. Snyder, the Snyder Cut's coming out. Oh, you better believe I am all about that. I want right? to see Darkseed in that. I, for I, sure. I, you know, I just want to oh, see what his initial vision was because I haven't liked yeah. Zack Snyder. But anyway, but my point being, I can tell you, yes, I like that movie. You won't like it. It's not good, <laughs> right? right? Yeah, yeah. Um, with, with Talent of Horus, and the follow-up, Black Legion, still two best, I, in my opinion, the two best books in Black Library's arsenal. Well, I have Black Legion queued for when when the the hobby dam breaks, which I yeah. feel like is is coming soon. Yeah. Um. And then that's usually when I get you know fair amount in. I, I'm I'm actually really looking forward to to revisiting those characters, and yeah. and I think that's really Aaron Dembski Bowden's strength. Uh, he's a really great character author. He for sure. really yep, develops. Absolutely. Um characters well uh you know and i mean somebody contacted me a while back about like you know they were just asking if because i do teach english admittedly it's, yeah. it's high school english and whatnot but if that's probably why i'm lukewarm on most 40k fiction and we talked is, about that like, yeah 
Right. Yeah, yeah. It is. And, but I will like hats off. No, the guy develops characters beautifully. Yeah. He understands how to get into motivations and, and makes people interesting and kind of complex, you know, mm -hmm. what we call, you know, well-rounded characters that, that aren't they have mul and, multiple layers and, to like, them yeah. and, and manipulates that well. Yeah. Um, that even when he does something you expect him to do, he puts his own fingerprint on it. Um, so yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed that. So thank you for the recommendation. Mm -hmm. I look forward to the next. I'm one excited. You, I was skeptical. I'm excited. You liked it. Cause to, to me it's like, I've reread it three times now. I've actually bought it in the special edition, the regular edition and the digital edition, because, oh, wow. you know, like at one point shells like, well, I want to read this and we only had the Kindles and I'm like, well, I already have it. Okay. Here, let's just buy this again. You know, so yeah. I've done my share. There you go. Well, and I think that, I think that, uh, uh, one, another really good uh, point to that is somebody who was on the community page was started reading the spears of the emperor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at first they're like, yeah, well, I don't know. And then oh, yeah. they came back later and said, I finished it. And like, Oh my gosh. I take it all back. This was a really good book. That is, yeah. Shell thinks the same that's thing, his that strongest. The characters really develop over the course of that story. Yeah. And if you try and extend the story from what the first couple chapters are, you're not getting it. Shell thinks that's yeah. his strongest, but for me, uh, no, no, it's Black Legion. Yeah, yeah I, I would say Black Legion for me. Well, you know, it's oh, all yeah. Yeah, no, of course, Black Legion's but better. I'm just saying, Spears of the Emperor. It, it, to me, it's another example of how Aaron. Aaron really does well with oh, yeah. character development. It, it, and agreed. Definitely the strength of that book. Agreed. No doubt about it. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Happy to yammer about those uh, with anybody who wants to online. <laughs> so we're, we're not doing the challenge right now since we're all separated and this really hasn't <laughs> come up, but Josh, you have a note in here about the well, challenge the last, we the issued. Last in person oh. episode we recorded, which this months ago at like this four point, months ago. Uh, I, I threw down the gauntlet of the challenge being to paint a single Adeptus Titanicus unit. And since shelter in place has happened, I have finished all of my Titans. <laughs> well, so I will say challenge complete, but, <laughs> but yeah, the challenge uh, hasn't really been a thing. Yeah, so. The twist I was bringing to that was, was I was going to paint my, my knight <laughs> be like, <laughs> technically it's an Adeptus Titanicus <laughs> unit. <laughs> It is a there unit in Adeptus Titanicus. Josh and Talking I. Have... Of, speaking of Adeptus Titanicus, I I did pick up the new uh, Aeronautica Imperialis, same scale. Yeah. With the with the the Valkyries and the Lightnings. Oh, I can't wait to. That's a game I'm not I, getting into. <laughs> no, I know. I just like the. I just like the. I love the Lightning. They're neat. Uh, like, so one of my favorite yeah. models. The models stuff. are great. I just yeah. I just don't need but, yet another. It was so funny when I opened the first when the first one came out. I opened the box. I was like. Oh, you have to assemble these. <laughs> what did you think you were going to have to do? Like X Wing. I thought it was going to be like X Wing, where the stuff was pre painted. Hey, and, crazy. Uh, assembly. assembly and painting says Oil GW wash on the and outside. everything. Yeah. 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 Sound like GWs. Amateur move. All right. <laughs> Let's talk games played. So uh, I did run a Rogue Trader game for our group. Yeah, you no. did. If you no. are a Patreon member, you can actually go watch the, the live play or the whatever you call it, the actual play of, of that. Um, now, that being said, uh, it was a bit shortened of an adventure as we were just trying to kind of get the mechanics down and, and see some of the highlights there, uh, let people it's fun, though. play around. Yeah, it was fun. I thought it was a good time. Um, it's a good test drive, for sure. Yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk more about that. Um, and then primarily, I'm running a Call of Cthulhu game weekly uh, with, with uh, two of the three members <laughs> that are here um, with uh, Josh and Jody and Austin and uh, uh, Doug. And uh, that game is kind of the highlight of my week at the moment. I am really, Super really enjoying enjoyable. it. Yeah. yeah. Really enjoying that. Um, and that's going to go on for quite a while as that is uh, the horror on the Orient Express, which is a cool lengthy. <laughs> <laughs> good Lord. <laughs> it's it's been a challenge it's been fun i think everybody's having a good time with it so yeah, yeah. it's good absolutely josh what have you been uh doing you actually tried to co coerce me into something recently uh yeah it, it's actually been a while since i've done most of these the the games but i had i did play uh two games of adeptus titanicus on tabletop simulator with loopy uh and there was kind of uh intro learning games with him yeah. um this was again a little little while ago um he had played one game i think in person before before that so he had some foundation of how the game plays and yeah. mechanics but it, it had been a while since he played um 
and I, I was giving him a hard time about, uh, well, I mean, we were hoping to actually play some games in person at Adepticon, which then of course did not you happen. This right. Year. Same. Yeah. But so he, like he had started painting his warlords and he's like, Oh, I'm not going to make it in time. And it's like, what you can paint at that loopy speed. Like you'll be done in, in no time. And he did, he finished in time for Adepticon. And then of course Adepticon canceled. Um, but anyways, we, we played two games of Adeptus Titanicus and had, had great games, walked him through it, you know, did the, the standard do, I think the first turn we did no orders on the first game and then orders of every turn thereafter just yeah. to kind of do that that intro turn and then everything else and the second game was considerably quicker and uh went well full orders and all that so two two really fun games he's such a great guy and uh just you know good good chatting with him you said those were on tabletop simulator josh yeah yeah how do you find that interface for uh adeptus titanicus because yeah, different consoles. games do better and worse with TTS. I I would never play a game of 40k on TTS personally because there's so much going on, and so many units to track, things like that. That's how a I game feel. of Adeptus Titanicus, though. You have your terminal, and it's just super easy to like pick up and drop your thing on the the you know slot that it needs to be on, and you're only <laughs> dealing with five or six models, so it's right. actually really intuitive. Huh. Um, the way objects in tabletop simulator work when you pick them up, you, you hit your, you know, Q or E to rotate them to, and those are 15 degree increments. So if you're trying to do turns, Titans can turn up to 45 degrees as a turn. Three, it's actually really clicks. precise yeah. if you want to get right. that kind of exact increment <clears throat> of turning on there. And it, that in some ways it's, it's easier in some ways it's harder. Um, the, the only downside I would say to it is the uh, line of sight, since line of sight is drawn from each individual weapon mm -hmm. in Adeptus Titanicus, rather than ah. kind of a generic, this is the model and it shoots. It's harder to get your camera in position to get that line yeah. of sight it's easy precisely. To get, it's easy to get uh, seasick. Yeah. Uh, I, it, it's For easy me. enough to, to rough it out, but if you want to be super precise, it's not as good as in person. Yeah. Yeah. But other uh -huh. than that, I'd say the game actually works really well. So. Yeah, that's what you were oh, saying. Cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of uh, wish that they had one of those something where you could like click on the gun, click on the target, and it'll tell you whether you can see it or not through the terrain that's there. That'd be nice. That would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what else, Josh? Um, I got a it was just a learning kind of walkthrough of Aeronautica Imperialis with John Trapman. Yeah. Um, so again, this is on Tabletop Simulator, uh, since he's in Texas. Um but it was it was a good kind of feeling of just seeing like this is how the orders work. These are the maneuvers you can take. We didn't actually play that much of a game. He just mostly walked me through the fundamentals of it. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a game I'm not gonna buy in person because I have so many games to play right now. Maybe right. I will if they come out with cool Necron or Eldar planes or something like that. But at this point in time, I've got so many other systems I'm invested in. Like I'm I'm not gonna bite the bullet and jump into it. But for Tabletop Simulator, it it does look like a really fun game, and I. You know, for the little low price of already owning Tabletop Simulator, right. I'll definitely <laughs> yeah. give it some plays, especially while Shelter in Place is happening. Hex based, yeah, I mean, too. You, so really, it makes you it... really can't poke them on the GW games these days. It's yeah. just impossible. It's all hex based, too, so it's much easier. Yeah, yeah. It, it works great with the, the grids. And it's pretty neat how you, you add your base, and there's the card there that has what you're doing. And uh, yeah. you oh, add cool. your, your plane onto the base, and it it's all scripted, so it combines the objects. And it's uh, it's it's pretty nicely done. Cool. Uh, and aside, yeah, aside from that, I've just been doing um, board games, also on tabletop simulator in person with my wife, and a bunch of role playing games. Planning a couple two D and D games, and the uh, Call of Cthulhu game that you mentioned. <laughs> Same with me. Really RPG is really yeah. making a uh, rebound here amongst our group. Yeah, man, yeah, you ain't for sure. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's good to get back to the roots, though. Jody. Yeah, well said, Josh. We, good to get back to roots. Yeah, I am dusting off my RPG chops not only as a player but running my own kind of purely home spun game that's like a mishmash of a bunch of different styles of it's a fantasy game so D, &D as a generic term um been doing that with my my actually my daughter and my wife and, and having a lot of fun with that uh also playing in a blitz bowl summer league on tabletop simulator cannot mention that without saying thanks josh who built the nice. tabletop simulator. he's responsible for the whole league <laughs> yeah nice. and is not playing uh -huh. in it but understandable because it's a <laughs> because Matt planned it and it's on Matt time. So you, you better buy in and be ready to go. Um, <laughs> but uh, been enjoying it. weird. I like Blitz Bowl. Who knew? But uh, that's been the extent of my play is, is at home doing a lot of RPG stuff uh, and then some online. And then, yeah, some, some Blitz Bowl on Tabletop Simulator, which works real well. Nice job, Josh. Nice. Ooh, go me. <laughs> Adon? 
Yeah. I, um, well, other than the rogue trader that we played, one of our local guys is starting a, um, it's a dark heresy mm-hmm. uh, campaign, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but he's going, he's, he's saying having people start at like really low level. Mm-hmm. So you're like not even good enough to become an acolyte yet. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the characters are all on a penal colony or were on a penal colony ship. And now they're like conscripted, uh, workers on a, on a starship. And nice. so we haven't really started the actual campaign. We just spent, I don't know, a couple hours on getting the characters together and kind of getting his concept. He rewrote mm-hmm. a lot of the rules. He just kind of overwrote what was already there and did it in longhand and like scan the pages. If this guy put in, wow. Kyle put in a ton of work. And so shout out to Kyle. It's amazing. So, yeah, so I got that going and I'm uh, looking forward to getting that campaign started. But we, it was fun do it, going through the character creation thing. And I always enjoy that part. Yeah. When I was when I was a kid, I would like roll up 17 characters. Just make characters for fun. Yeah. 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 Uh, played in a couple of tabletop simulator games with my son. Played a, we did a 500 point one, just kind of try it out and see if how we, if we like the interface. The interface is really, really mm-hmm. Um, clunky, clunky. Yeah, it's you difficult. know what? It's better than it's better. What was that other? It was like that other online forty k oh, yeah. thing, like yeah. many years ago. And I tried that once, and I was like, "Ugh, this is it." it so tabletop simulator is better than that by a long shot. But yeah, but it started it's, with a V or is, something. We found some things that were kind of helped out, and sure. and we're able to kind of hand wave some stuff. Because, yeah, you yeah. Know, we know each other well. We did a five hundred point game. Um, he used his Tau and I used, uh, Marines and then, and I just decided to use the stuff from the cracked mirror match, the Depticon list that we had. And then for, I said, well, let's try a thousand points and let's try the cracked mirror idea, but mm-hmm. we'll do it with points instead of uh, power level. And so we did a 1000 point game. We both had Marines, um, and super fun. I mean, he, he kicked my butt, the 500 point game. He just thrashed me, uh, the thousand point game uh, I lost, but it wasn't quite as humbling. <laughs> So my, my son's definitely picking up 40 K uh, pretty well. <laughs> nice. Um, so that was kind of fun. And I think we're playing tomorrow afternoon. Again, nice. Another awesome. Thousand point game. So. Nice. Oh. All right. Well, let's do this. Let's take a short break then we'll come back and we'll uh, launch right into our rogue trader coverage. Um, the RPG, which is, uh, as we mentioned before, currently out of print, but you can get that drive through RPG and occasionally on, uh, What's it called? The Humble Bundle, Humble bun- Humble bundle on occasion. Uh, so we'll be right back. All right, and we are back, and we are going to start talking about Rogue Trader, the RPG role-playing game, uh, which was re- uh, released in 2009, so it's already 11 years old, back when Fantasy Flight Games wow. had a license with Games Workshop to produce these uh, role-playing things and a few board games that were kind of cool. Uh, but I think, you know, let's start off with kind of what is an, a role-playing game. For people who maybe are not familiar, um, in a role-playing game you have one player that plays... Um, the, the referee or game master, and they're responsible for controlling basically everything that every other player uh, comes into contact with. So they set the story, they set the stage. Uh, if you're looking at it from an acting kind of thing, uh, they've, they've created the props, the stage, the, the characters that you're going to meet, and then uh, every individual, every other individual in the game plays a character that they have created and takes on the persona of that character. And it's basically rules for make belief is what it boils right. down yeah. to. That's it. storytelling. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful right. way to put it. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, um, it's kind of it's kind of in the name. It's a role playing game. You're you're playing a role. Yeah. A character that you've created. Yeah. Yeah. And I've uh, I've as you know I've said many times uh, I cut my teeth on role playing games initially. Dungeons and Dragons was the first game I played, and I played that for years until honestly just recently. I'm still playing, but I'm kind of losing some interest in that particular game. Uh, but, uh, you know, this game, as you were pointing out during the break, Jody pulls, um, elements from a lot of other role-playing games. Right. Yeah. It, it really, as we were reading through it and prepping to play and then prepping to talk about it here on the show, 
that's what kept jumping out to me is like all these different games. We can kind of call those things out as we see them as we go through this, but it calls out all these these different mechanics because exactly as you said, I, I think of it the same way as like a role playing game. Any game, it's it's a system of rules that allows us all to play make believe together. You know, right. when you're a kid, if you remember sitting and playing with your friends, and you've got each got an action figure, and it's my guy shoots your guy. No, my guy shot your guy. No, but my guy did this, and then you end up arguing with your brothers, and your mom makes you sit in the corner. Is that just me? Yeah. Just um, me. <laughs> but you know, it's the, how do you resolve that? And I mean, every RPG at its core is the game master, the person who's the the judge. They describe something. The players describe how they react and interact with that thing that the GM described. You roll some dice to determine what the heck happens. And then the GM, based on what you rolled, makes determinations about what happens next. Yep. And the last step is your character gets better over time for the vast majority of role-playing games. And right. then you get to stick with this person and, and learn that role. And this this does all those things. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's a, it's a, sure it's a framework for that. It's a, mm-hmm. For sure. And obviously this one takes place in the 41st millennium. Um, so he, as I said, released 2009, there are actually five, uh, various games using a very similar system. They are not really intended to be played with each other. And there's a little slight difference in a couple of them, but f- you could, uh, play characters from each of these, uh, together in some kind of weird, you know, system where, you, where you're, uh, <clears throat> all working there. They, the, each of the games has their strengths and weaknesses, um, right. the, the five games are Dark Heresy, which was the first one released, then Rogue Trader, uh, then Death Watch, um, then Only War, and then Black Crusade. Uh, and we'll cover Only War and Black Crusade. We've covered the other two already. Um, and Rogue Trader is interesting as, in, in the sense that it plays unlike... It, it plays unlike the other uh, games. Uh, Mechanics-wise, it's all there. But the whole theme and the way it plays is very different, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Right. Um, the basic rule book is almost 400 pages. It's 398 pages. If you have a copy of the hardback, it is excellently produced. I mean, just mm-hmm. top quality yeah. uh, book. I have to call out really quick just because I'm such a such a fanboy. Um, the lead developer on this series, on all of these, was Ross Watson, who at the time was, was at Fantasy Flight. Yeah, big um, RPG background with that guy. Yep, but... To me, more importantly, uh, in this book, uh, under the written and developed by, you see names like Alan Bly, John French, Andy Hoare. You know, these are guys who are steeped in the lore of Warhammer 40K. Mm-hmm. And, Absolutely. And even if you don't play the game, like the lore and yeah. information in these books is fascinating to read through. So, yeah, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. Even uh, on the digital. Yep. Just, just go buy the drive through RPG version of the of the main rulebook just for the lore. Yeah. And by the way, worth it. all of these are based on the system developed by uh, three people, Owen Barnes, Kate Flack, and Mike Mason, who is the lead developer at Chaosium for Call of Cthulhu. So Call that's a nice Cthulhu. callback right there. So um, Alan and Mike and John are good friends, or were good friends in the case of Alan. But uh, so there, there's... There's real weight behind what's in these. It's not just, right. you know, these are like lore masters from Games Workshop that were actively involved in writing this stuff. So it's fascinating. I think that's hugely important <laughs> because I think when you're getting into a product for an IP like, you know, 40K mm-hmm. and it's not produced by GW proper, we certainly have seen instances of that in the past in other games where With licensed games, yeah. Yeah, licensed games, and you're going, that's not quite right, or mm, that feels a little off. Um, and GW has always been pretty good about making sure those things stay reasonably close. Right. But I mean, here, those names you're calling off, those, those are about as, as high quality of uh, bona fides as you're going to see, of that you really have that authenticity and stamp of approval that you are getting really. It, can, you know, this stuff becomes canon at the point that it's those guys saying, no, this is how right. this works. Yeah. It's not, oh, in this alternate timeline, it's no, this, this is, this is really how the world works. It's really interesting in this for Rogue Trader too, because it's such an iconic part of 40k. Yeah, that the original doesn't name. actually, like there's, I, there's so many people who play 40k that who did not play Rogue Trader or haven't read the lore extensively and Weren't don't actually when it came out. know that much <laughs> about Rogue Trader. It's like, it's such an iconic part of 40K and this brings it to life in the lore, but also the gameplay Yeah, uh, to those not familiar 
with that part of the background, even if they are avid uh, <coughs> tabletop players. Yeah. Well, and even it's if much- you are an old, been around this from from jump kind of person up till about ten years ago. I mean, the rogue trader and what he was and what he or she represented as a, as an entity within the the mythos was not something that was really talked about or touched yeah, on from obscure. the original original d day right. yeah no it's this marquee name right. yep um so you know here getting a, a real deep dive on it is is pretty cool it's pretty cool yeah, i heard an interview with a, a guy who was helping to write some of the background stuff for some of the books in these series and he he said it was he was talking about how terrifying it was because of the main names that were involved uh-huh and you don't want to be writing stuff and have them go uh sorry pal that's not how it works <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of interesting because the names you read off those are those are the heavy hitters right yeah so in my, in you don't want to write mind. something and have them go who are you and what are you writing <laughs> yeah so um so let's talk about the game itself so for usually the the first thing that happens is and actually this is one of the interesting things about the book um not only is the book well designed the art in it is fantastic yeah um really in keeping with the the 40k aesthetic all of that but um <clears throat> one of the interesting things about the way the book is organized is really the beginning is kind of character creation which is pretty standard in a, in a in a role playing game book um character creation you know uh here's the skills here's the talents here's the equipment that you can get um Here's some rules around spaceships or starships and that kind of thing. But then the whole latter half of the book is how do you play the game, right? And so you're really kind of introduced from the get-go on create a character. Now here's how you play the game. And it starts talking at that point about here's all those skills you were just talking about. This is how they're used. This is it, I just thought the organization of the book is actually very conducive to me. Uh, grasping what what was going on, and then the latter third of the book is all lore and and that kind of thing in a right. in a scenario. I think that's hugely important because this is not an easy to play role playing game. If this is your first timid steps into the world of role playing, this is not a junior level role playing. No, if you have never played a role playing game before, this is you know buckle up. It's mechanically <laughs> dense. Yeah, um, it's yeah. not hard. I wouldn't say to, to learn or play, but it's dense. There's a lot of information there, but the book does lay it out in a way that's really easy to work with. I mean, even, you know, when we were playing, because we, part of that was, was learning the rules. I felt like the couple of times we stopped and looked things up, we resolved those, those issues really Pretty quickly yeah. because the book was easy to work with. Even with a PDF, like I wasn't searching my PDF and it was still easy to find. Things. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And yeah, we were so. lucky because Doug knew the game really well too. So yeah. Yeah, help us know where to look. <laughs> well, and the, the nice thing was to, <clears throat> like, for example, Josh looked into his character and how the psychic abilities work and that kind of thing. So right. he kind of specialized in that area so that even as I was running it, I was like, okay, Josh, how does this work? And Josh would go, okay, so this is how this works, yeah. which was nice. Typically, as a referee, you don't you want to know all the rules, but it was kind of nice to be able to, you know, uh, offload that kind of crowdsource the yeah, <laughs> rules right, across yeah. our group at that point. And it worked very well, I think. I should I should have totally overpowered him and made him way better. So. Should have. <laughs> yeah, you should have. So should have made him <laughs> made him work against. So him in our game, I gave you pre-generated characters that had been provided <laughs> right. for the adventure we ran. But when you want to create your own characters, as with most role-playing games, you have a set of attributes, and these look very familiar to players of 40k. As you have a weapon skill and a ballistic skill, then you have a strength, a toughness, and then it gets a little further: agility intelligence, perception, willpower, and fellowship. And all of these abilities affect how your skills work and, and that kind of thing. Um, they're very easy to get a score. They're usually a score between uh, 45 and uh, uh, 27. Um, and that's generated by rolling two 10-sided dice and then adding 25 to each of them. Now, there's things, people- there's things that will modify that later, but um, that's your base kind of score. And for people who are into role-playing games, just we'll say off the top, this is what's called a D100 <clears throat> system. Oh, good call. So it'll it'll set up a kind of a, in your mind, if you play a lot of role-playing games, you'll kind of get where we're coming from on this. It's all a percentile-based you know, system. Percentile, exactly. yeah. Right. So if, you're, if your skill is 65%, you have about a 65% chance of achieving success. And right. we'll talk a little bit about that. And it's so a little Carl bit different. Saying, you start off with like a 27 to 45% chance of being able to do stuff. And so how you modify things will become important. Yep. Uh, and you will be modifying things. 
So then what yeah. happens after you've developed your, your initial uh, abilities, you go through what's called the origin path, and these will change your character. Uh, the first thing is, what kind of home world are you from? Were you born in space? Did you live on a spaceship the whole time? Maybe you grew up on a high-gravity planet. That would increase your strength, but maybe cause you know something else to drop. Um, you go through uh, creating this origin path, which determines your home world, uh, then what kind of trials and difficulties you, you went through growing up, and then what is ultimately your character's motivation? It gives you some ideas around that as well. These were pretty neat reading the pre-gen character, especially um, the like the home world. My character grew up on a hive world. So some of the things that it said was like, you're really comfortable in a crowd. So you, right. I think you get an initiative bonus right, uh, for being around people, but you don't do good in open spaces because you're paranoid about their not being atmosphere or something like that because right. you're used to growing up uh, in the underhive. So right. it, um, yeah, it, it, was, it was just neat. Now, one of the interesting things about most role-playing games, and in particular Dungeons and Dragons, which we you can't not compare this to Dungeons and Dragons just because that's the big big dog in in the group, and everybody can kind of draw a reference to it for the most part. Um, <clears throat> in Dungeons and Dragons, the real objective of the game is ultimately to get more powerful by killing monsters, defeating traps, whatever, gaining experience points, making you more and more powerful, to gather magical items and to ultimately gather wealth, uh, right. whether that's items, you know, land, gold, whatever. Um, this game is very, very different in that, in that fact, and we'll talk a little bit later about how you play the game, but it's really important to understand that this is not about necessarily gathering individual wealth. This is about gathering wealth for your rogue trader house. And so that's not measured in like, hey, we're going to do this deal and I'm going to pay you X quadrillion credits to, to tr you know, take this material to another star system. It's really based around this thing called the profit factor. And the profit factor is really kind of a representation. It's a number that represents how powerful or how weak your rogue trader and their house has become as a result of your actions. So as you succeed in various scenarios, you gain um, you gain profit factor. And as you maybe fail or don't succeed in certain areas, you may even lose a uh, profit factor. And that profit factor is just an arbitrary number kind of between one and, and 150 or 60 or whatever. There's no upper limit um, <clears throat> that really determines how much uh, material your house has access to, what kinds of equipment you can get, and that kind of thing. So the more profitable your house, the more prestige you have, and that kind of thing. Maybe it opens up doors, you know, political doors, and that kind of thing. Reputation. Um, yeah, yes. Yep. So. And I think this is one of the major diversions from that kind of that kind of stereotypical idea of RPGs where it, <clears throat> there's a much more macro view. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of there, putting it. Than there is where before it's all about me it's a very micro view should we yeah, maybe we should talk about that now because yeah. because yeah, we're kind of dancing around it but I, I think doug did a great job of describing yeah. like in most role-playing games hey jody you're the wizard adon you're the paladin josh you're the cleric i'm the fighter we go and we fight monsters okay great right. this is a game that is more like star trek than that kind of adventure meaning you have at your disposal if you are playing a rogue trader or really any of the rogue traders allies men at arms at your disposal you have an entire ship i mean we know how large ships in in 40k are right. uh you could have an adventure on a ship all together <laughs> like right. it's so massive you could have multiple adventures there's crevices and creeks and you know cracks and crannies that nobody's visited and you know, hundreds and maybe thousands of years uh, in this ship. Um, so you could have all kinds of interesting uh, encounters there. Um, but the reality is, like, there's situations where you could say, well, we're going to go down to the planet. Well, in Star Trek, Captain Kirk goes down to the planet with Spock. I don't know why they send, like, their first tier of officers always down to the planet. But, That's what um, they don't next generation. The uh, captain's not allowed to go. Right, but, uh, you know, here <clears throat> um, you could say, well, yeah, the captain's going to go down to the planet, but his you know, effectively bodyguard may say, okay, fine, you're going to go down to the planet, but we're bringing 25 guys to, to protect them while we go down to this planet. And so you have a bunch of guards there with you. Now, when you get into combat, I mean, these guys, you're not going to roll out a, 
a combat of t- my 25 guys versus these, you know, you're going to, there's some arbitrary, as you said, a macro view of Don right. where you're like, yep. you know, okay. You abstract it. Yeah. Yeah. Some of these guys are going to die. Some are not, you know, um, and it make it makes a very interesting tool for a game master as well, because you can, you can portray to the party intense danger by killing off the red shirts around them <laughs> and, yeah. and like I, showing I you it. like this is a dangerous situation okay what do we do now so there's kind of see it more like star wars you know where they would land a whole bunch of stormtroopers down with them where in star trek you always say five or six guys in i star disagree wars, come I, in and they're like oh, i disagree these. because star wars is really about luke skywalker han solo chewbacca Princess Leia. Sorry, the Imperial side, they'd come down with a bunch of troopers and right. they'd have I mean, all these all these I, red shirts that were white shirts. Yeah, but I think <laughs> the I think the Star Trek analogy is a really good one. You have a ship, you are the yep. the commanding officers of this yeah. ship. Yeah, yeah. You're the bridge right. crew. Yeah. The bridge crew, yeah. And you have the rest of the lackeys behind you who are gonna do yep. what you say. Yep. And they but all just, have a role too. Yeah, Sp- yeah. Speaking to the scale of it, one thing we look were looking up while playing it was the actual size of the the ships and the like crew and personnel allotments to the scale of those ships, and I think the smallest one there was twenty seven thousand. Yeah, yeah. So you're like you're dealing with tens of thousands of people on like the smaller side of these rogue trader ships, and that's any of the vessels just in forty k. Ships are huge. Yeah, and it does so, pose a challenge too for a, sure. a GM to say okay why are you guys going to get involved in this discussion? Why would the rogue trader even be involved in this? Well, and I think it presents some problems for the players as well that are unique to this system that mm-hmm. as a player, you're making decisions, not again, and Don, as you pointed out, not just about what's good for me, but it's this macro view. And, and, you know, as, as I was, you know, I, I ended up playing the rogue trader in our group. Yeah you know, first getting my head around that scale, which I completely hadn't considered and was so happy that, that Doug, you know, and Adon, you guys pointed that out pretty early on to me of like, Hey, no, you've got, you know, you want to call down an airstrike, go ahead. Yep. Um, you know, but then also just getting that mindset is a little bit different. I think it, I think some of the questions that these career paths or these character types that you can play in, ask you as the player to make some really interesting decisions. And I think it presents the GM with a really unique kind of set of, if you've run any of the kind of classic role-playing games, be it D&D or Call of Cthulhu, there's very specific patterns that you're aware of, Mm -hmm. you know, that Mm -hmm. in exactly as you described, Carl, in D&D, it's that you're going to go kill monsters and take on noble quests. In In Call Call of Cthulhu, Cthulhu, you better have a library (laughs) useful. You're going to do research until you find the thing that eats you and you die, and that's your character's (laughs) arc, right? That's that's how characters exist. Well, you go insane and then you die. It's a little both. You've got, yeah. you know, Hopefully the in that order. Which of those two is going <laughs> to happen? That order, yeah. <laughs> Will I go nuts and die or go die and, you and know, then, then yeah. be nuts because I'm in another realm? <laughs> yeah. But they, they play out in similar ways. Shadow run, you know, I'm going to take a job and I'm going to do a thing. I'm yeah, going to take right. a job and I'm going to do a thing, right? This, both for GM and player, I think you get to do something pretty unique. Yeah. Um, exactly as you said, because of this, you know, for lack of a better term, Star Trek dynamic of, of having all of those elements. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so there's a couple interesting things that that offers as well. Um, you know, you use the, the whole point of call down an airstrike or whatever. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, you could absolutely say, Hey, you know, our ship's in orbit. We have Lance weapons. Let's just call it a Lance strike on this thing. Sure. Go ahead. I mean, it offers some cool opportunities you don't normally get access to in those kinds of games. That being said, um, Doug presented an interesting point. Um, that I hadn't thought of before. And another problem with, with this kind of game, it's not really a problem with the game so much as you need to make sure you have the right group playing this game. Because in some cases you have, for example, Jody was the rogue trader. Everybody basically reports to Jody, right? Like right. he's in charge. Yeah, and it's definitely going to be a power dynamic. And so there's a power dynamic and people need to understand that, you know, look, this guy's in charge of the group. And this is a problem we've run into with various games that have like a military bent to them as well. Well, I'm the right. captain. Well, I'm not going to do what the captain says. Well, you know, okay, look, are you playing the game or are you not, right? I mean, right. There, so, but Doug proposed a really interesting solution to this, which is in some cases you just make the rogue trader an NPC. Everybody else is effectively working for him. And the GM right. is the rogue trader giving you the the missions and, and assignments. And that kind of solves that problem right there. I thought that was a really, really cool but, way to do it. 
it makes it the, doing it that I like that, and it, doing it that way makes it more in the line of dark heresy, mm-hmm. where you're mm-hmm. acolytes working for the non-present inquisitor. Yeah, and so it, you have more of that feel that way. And I, it, like you say, it makes it makes the operating of the group maybe a little bit uh, a little bit easier. Now, if you have a group where you have the you know the classic alpha player, yeah, who always wants to take the lead, then fine, just make them the rogue trader. Well, yeah, it, that can lead to some some hurt feelings. The other interesting thing, just to pivot off your dark heresy comment there, is dark heresy. Also, you start off really pathetic. Like, if, oh yeah, hey, I shoot, I miss. Yeah, I shoot, I miss again. Um, the characters here were way more effective than that, uh, especially oh, yeah. in close combat. Yeah. Um, but so I think I think they had said originally the characters in Rogue Trader were equivalent to like fifth or sixth level characters in Dark Heresy. But what's interesting with Dark Heresy too is there's a dynamic that changes there as you go up to like the upper levels and you actually become you actually have the opportunity to become Inquisitors. Now the game could really shift into more of a political structure game where you have multiple Inquisitors dealing with problems in very different ways. And it really delves into the radical versus, you know, um, Puritan. Puritan. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, this, I'm just saying at this level, when you start off, you're already starting off at that. Yeah. We have a starship, a massive starship. I just, I just right. meant the dynamic yeah. of having the leader be an NPC. Yeah. Yeah. No, I yeah. understand. Uh, it's just another approach to the game that, that you can take that hadn't, I hadn't really considered. And I thought yeah. it was a great observation yeah. by Doug. Well, was yeah, it, yeah. Uh, like the rogue trader bonuses i'm sure we'll get into a bit more but they they can they can actually dish out bonuses in in action and yeah. for tests and things like that yeah having having an npc seem like okay what's really important as the gm knowing what needs to happen in this encounter and the rogue trader can you know, yeah. yeah do their own thing. But, so let's yeah. talk real quick about those roles the what those roles are are actually and so we have the rogue trader which jody you played in the game uh yeah. we did um he is obviously the the character the game is named after um He's a jack of all trades, master of none. He's he's good at command and and um, kind of as you mentioned, Josh, telling other people what to do. And in combat, that equates to giving other people bonuses and and uh, l- kind of leading from the front. He is not a wimp in close combat, as we yeah, found. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, swords are actually uh, <clears throat> pretty powerful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then we have the arch militant, which is kind of a combat yeah. expert. Uh, that was what you were playing, Adon. Any yep. comments you want to make on that? Yep. Lorraine. I was playing Lorraine. Um, yeah, I think that it's a it's the classic, it's the rogue trader version of the fighter or barbarian. <laughs> but she was, yeah. it's set up to have a lot of really good um, uh, modifiers mm-hmm. for close combat specifically. Um, for example, one of the things that she had was the ability to, to improve everybody else's targeting mm-hmm. um it was called combat formation so um it's it was, really it was an initiative bonus right if right initiative bonus yeah if your initiative so was, was less than your four, stat think, yeah. or yeah whatever yeah. it was Never I, just, I just think it's really cool that it was built to kind of play off of other people but her role was to be exactly what she was the bodyguard to the rogue trader yep yep uh then you have the astropath transcendent uh this is the uh Psychic communication <laughs> psyker for for the ship. Uh, Josh, you were playing this role. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's really it's a comms expert, and you know, going back to the the old bridge crew analogy, comms person, but they're doing all their communications with um, psychic abilities. They're fully sanctioned by the emperor, and have there's actually some pretty cool lore that goes into the background of the character about the uh, receiving the emperor's blessing and actually being soul bound to the emperor and all that, and how that you know, affects the ability of this psyker right. to uh, utilize their their talents but also how rare it is for psychers to a be of that potency level and survive the process i think, I think one of this, the pro- oh, go ahead i was going to say i think this is one of the more unique mm-hmm. experiences um well you know we we ran into some bumps when we played it is in terms of this particular the astropath's role in that scenario that exactly that's scenario. exactly what right. i was going to say but i think it's an incredibly unique yeah, character like it playing an astropath is is fascinating in that you're getting to see things that are really hand wave kind of abstractions in general 40k experience um in terms of like a tabletop 40k experience yeah the the astropaths we all know like oh yeah they're really important in the the 41st millennium but here getting to be in one in real 
in real quote, life, unquote, so real life. Quote, unquote, yeah, yeah. take on the role of one. But it also, I think characters like this are always really fun because as the GM, it, it forces you, you know, one of the roles of a GM in any game is that their job is to make sure everybody's having a good time. Yes. So if you're the GM here, what are you going to create for the astropath to do? What are, yeah. Where are they going to get their moment to shine where their, their existence is this entire other plane yeah. you know it's kind of the old problem yeah. i think carl you mentioned it that um the cyberpunk always has Net the runner. hacker problem yeah. right that like some character who's a super hacker as the gm you are responsible for making sure the hacker is still invested in everything that's going on and you have to build almost two different scenarios at all yeah. times and i felt like the astropath like starts creating that scenario where the this level of communication and and global tie-in and you know heightened I th- awareness and- i think had the game that we ran been and it was interesting that they included this character in that scenario as a pre-gen yeah. because i yeah, felt yeah. like yeah. well you really did handicap this character like because bottom line is you have a lot of mind manipulation type of things and you were dealing with necrons and it's like well yeah. these things you can't mind manipulate so okay Great. I think that was a terrible, actually, choice of an inclusion for an NPC in this group. But I could see, like, in a game where you are having a lot of intrigue and that kind of thing, this character would be super powerful. A long-term campaign where you're having more a, there's a board ship action, so you're intercepting the transmissions, trying to get something out while the countdown timer is going, things like that. But also, like, the obfuscation with all those mind manipulation powers for a stealthy mission is huge, and not something you'd kind of traditionally think that character is good at, but they're really actually designed for that. Yep. Kind of like when we were trying to get into the tunnels to begin with that. Group right. Group. Yeah. Sure. It's like, Oh, I got this cool thing and we ended up not needing it. So yeah. exactly. And I, I kind of knew it was coming by that point. And I was like, Oh man, this is a real letdown, you know, <laughs> but uh, it was what it is. Uh, the Explorator is a tech priest that's assigned by the Adeptus Mechanicus to kind of rediscover lost science and technology. So usually they're, working with the rogue trader since the rogue traders on the outskirts of, of society a lot of times that's the yeah. character i should have played that would have been fun i think that <laughs> yeah, would have yeah. been way more fun especially knowing the encounter specifically after yeah the thing. but we did yeah. need experience with the psychic system yeah yeah no, I was uh the the missionary who's kind of a cleric of the god emperor and they're spreading their word and religion i mean again a missionary here is a fighter as well like they they yeah. i almost picked yeah. that one everybody yeah, can put a beat down yeah. Uh, you have the navigator, who's another psychic, but this one's skills are kind of at directing the ship itself and in interstellar voyages and relying on, you know, the um, astronomicon. Ast- astronomicon. I, I, I got to tell you, like, if I were to choose a character, it would not be this one to play. No. Like, I, I, if, if you're doing a lot of ship stuff, it might be interesting. Well, and I'll talk about that, too, yeah, it, yeah, later yeah. on. And then you have the Seneschal, which is the rogue trader's kind of right-hand man. Like, um, he's the... Uh, the non the grizzled non commissioned officer that that reports to the captain and you know does Doug the things the so captain well. needs done, and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah D- great job. Doug played him. that guy. You have the void master who's kind of an expert in running the ship itself, and then in the expansion books you have several other things like a croup mercenary, an orc freebooter, a cabalite warrior, uh, uh, a witch, an orc weird boy, and a tau fire warrior, and this is. This is one of the interesting things about rogue traders because they are on the outskirts of the Imperium itself. They're skirting the laws around the Imperium, and they're maybe a little, little more accepting of of um, other races kind of being a part of their group. I always thought it would be really interesting to play like an Eldar that like warrior or something that kind of travels with a rogue trader and that oh, kind a of weird thing. boy would be a really interesting mix. So big reach, stretch so. in my mind to have an <laughs> yeah, orc yeah. on there at all. So yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm not so hot on, on some of these, but uh, other ones I think would be kind of interesting. You know what, it, what sticks out to me here and it's kind of one of the old tropes of Dungeons and Dragons is like, okay, well, we're going to play D and D. Okay. Well, I want to play the fighter. Well then who's playing the cleric, right? right? That, that old, the kind of bargaining in classic Dungeons and Dragons of, of who's going to play what of the, if you're going with the original, you know, five or yeah. six original yeah. roles. It, it the does. <laughs> By the way, I always does... like playing a cleric. So I'm good. <laughs> there you go. Uh, this does almost demand that the play group, you know, what's referred to as a session zero of we're going to sit down. If you were going to play a campaign of this, not just a one shot that we sit down and we talk about 
what you know, that you power dynamic, yeah. um, you know, that was mentioned, especially around the rogue trader. If somebody's going to play the rogue trader, who is it? How are they going to play their rogue trader? Uh, I was, you know, thank you guys for being really cool players and let me letting me be that. Um, it was a lot of fun to play it. I don't know that that's something I would always want to play. Like, I don't there's some know. pressure there too. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, luckily the way that, you know, the one that they've written up, uh, old, what's his name, Sarvis Trask that I got to play, he's kind of just like impetuous and does his own thing. And he doesn't have that like heavy sense of responsibility. He's mm -hmm. kind of a loose cannon, which was really easy to play. Yeah, it was a pain um, and, for the bodyguard, though. Yeah, well, it cost you a leg, man. I need a new bodyguard. Oh, that's true, um, it did. <laughs> but uh but you played it super well adon and, and doug you know actually kind of was like well let me That'd remind you like yeah. he did you know it made all those things really well work really well and you know my astropath felt like aloof and uh astropathy um like what are you doing astropath stuff until you turned out the lights but that my point being sorry is is that the group needs to kind of talk about these different roles because Josh, you mentioned with like the navigator that if you're going to have ship to ship actions, well then having a navigator is really cool. Well then it would be really, really cool to have a navigator and an astropath in that group. Mm -hmm. you know? But well, then what's your arch militant going to be doing when that's going on exactly. or your, yeah. your missionary, you exactly. know, and you, an adventure where it's like, okay, well now the astropath and the navigator are going to have a lot of fun. But now we made Planet Fall. So the two of you just sit here and shut up and everybody else is going to play. And I think you got to okay. work with the GM a bit on that and figure out, okay, what kind of game is this going to be? Like we want to mm -hmm. decide what kind of game this is going to be because uh, we we want everybody to enjoy it. And if it doesn't make sense, like, hey, we're not going to have a lot of ship to ship combat. You're not going to really have to worry about that. Okay, cool. Exactly. Let's not bother with the navigator. That can be yeah, an NPC. Have an NPC. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So well, yeah, I, I think also that, wonder. That Sorry, go ahead, Adon. No, I was going to say, I also wonder with eight different roles, I wonder if you know, it would be a situation where maybe you had people pick two, like you had an astropath and then you were also the missionary. That's a very interesting right? point too, yeah. right? A, a kind of home and away a team. And yeah. The, yeah, right, a ship role and a planet fall role. That's actually a good point, Adon. Normally I'm not all for playing you know, multiple characters, but in that yeah. particular case, that makes a ton of sense actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, much like a rogue trader, right? That there's a lot of ways to spin it and there's a For lot sure. of different permutations. And, and it's a great idea, actually. I don't, you know, that there's a lot of ways to, to engage with yeah. the, the 41st millennium and the, the vastness of the Imperium um, through this game, which I think is probably one of its biggest strengths. And like I said, yeah. like previously, when I, I ran a Dark Heresy game, I ran a Dark Heresy and Death Watch game kind of at the same time. And basically, you had you know, the Inquisitor sending their acolytes down to go investigate this stuff. And then once the enemy was found or location or problem was found, well, now I send in the Death Watch Marines and every, and you would play one of each, right? So you'd switch, okay, right. now I'm going to play my Death Watch Marine. Now I'm going to go back to my acolyte. And so yeah. you saw the unfolding of the adventure from different angles. Yeah. Um, but so that's a great suggestion, Don. <clears throat> yeah, and just looking at the the characters that are there, like there's four kind of land based roles, and there's four right. kind of space based roles. So if you right. got a four player game going, then everybody's got a space role and a land role. Exactly. Right. Okay. All the fun, all the time. So, and then let's talk about the skill system because this is really a skill based system of a game. Yep. Um, you know, it, it is focused around skill tests and and success or failure of those skill tests, and it has kind of a unique approach to it. While Adon said, you know, hey, this is a percentile-based system or a D100 system, um, it, it really is about how many successes you get. So let me, what I mean by that is um, a, a challenge, they, they give you a table of difficult tests, right? So what, what I mean by that is a challenging test uh, that you're going to take. I'm going to shoot that can that is far away off, off of the fence post with my pistol okay great it's a challenging test you're at a, a zero modifier on that on that uh roll so you, what that means is um when you roll the the d100 uh every success you uh make uh is achieved by a 10 spot so if your skill is 65 percent and you roll a 55 you have succeeded by one level one degree. One degree of success, success right. right. Uh, if you roll a 25 and you have 65, you have now succeeded by four degrees because you have four full tens 
uh, of success. Likewise, you can fail by degrees. So I have 65, I roll a 75, I failed by uh, 10%. So um, you're basically testing uh, to see what you, what you, where you're succeeding. And then uh, you are checking against the modifier against these difficult, um, these difficulties here. So the challenge level of the, the skill, right. right? So uh, a challenge level of a very hard test, maybe it made it minus 30. So you are now uh, your 65 skills now 35. How many successes can you get based on on that? Right. Degrees of success. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'd say it's important to note that skills are based upon stats as well. Each stat, yeah. much like D and D, has kind of the basis of what that skill goes. So you're you you have your training in the skill, but then you also have your kind of base stat points that are going throwing in- throwing a knife would rely on your agility uh, right. stat plus yeah. your skill bonus at knives or what have you or thrown objects or whatever. And so, then depending on your degrees of success or degrees of failure you know, how well it succeeded, it could do like extra stuff yeah, or, yeah. or be extra, extra good. And where I, it, where I think that harder to avoid and where I think right. that system works really well is in what you call a pose checks. I yeah. am arm wrestling you, Adon. I have a 65 strength or, you know, in arm wrestling. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm making right. up a stat. You have a 45. My chance of rolling more degrees of success is what I will compare to, to your degrees right. of success or failure. And the person who gets the right. most successes wins right. the challenge. If we so. both rolled a 35, you would still win because you'd have three degrees Correct. of success. Correct. 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 Right. So it's it's a very interesting mechanic. I think it works fairly well. It just takes it's a, it takes a little adjusting uh, to get used to how it works. When we when we were talking about this during the game, it reminded me of playing uh, the, the fate system mm-hmm. because you roll fate dice, which have pluses and minuses on them. And when you roll the dice, if you get more pluses than minuses, then those are success. You know, you're succeeding, and then right. it was again the same thing about degrees of success. How many, how many more pluses than minuses did you get, or vice versa? And then that determined kind of what happened based on how well you did it. There's a lot of role playing games out there with a lot of different ways of handling yeah. skill tests and this kind of thing. Yeah. And this is a very yeah. unique one, I think. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting. On some level, I did find myself wondering a little bit, like, why don't it? it these being percentile roles felt really strange yeah, to me yeah, yeah. Um, in that this could just be a D10 role. Totally. That like, could've. okay, I have a stat that's a 60 whatever. So I rolled a D10 and anything six or less is a success. And then that's how many successes it is. The granularity of the individual one's digit, because even on the character sheet, if you have a stat that's say a 42, yeah. there's a big circle around the four. That your, the, the 10 your, digit, yeah. You know, the 10's digit is is called out as like, that's the important one. I was like, it. You know, so if somebody wanted a house to rule this and just go, you know, for streamlining and sake of ease and frankly would make the characters a little better. Um, yeah, and that, well, you know, it stinks when you have a, a 37 at something yeah. and you roll a 35 and you're like, oh man, I missed. Where, or, you know, you where, other it, way around. where it other comes way around. into play though is with character advancement. And as your character yes. advances, right, yeah. you're, you, it, really that that one's digit is your character advancement. And once you get it up to nine, you're like, if I spend one point in this, I'm going to now be so much better. Right. You know, so that's what it really is, is modifying. There's more granularity in things like the psychic table, like failure, even if you succeed in your skill with your bonuses, things like that. If you roll the 96, it automatically fails no matter what. So there, there is a little bit more granularity. I cannot say that right now. Uh, in, uh, In other parts of, the skill checks yeah Yeah. like with shooting and stuff too if you you roll a certain number your gun jams and stuff yeah and to to, back to carl's point about it can be kind of a difficult system and it sounds pretty straightforward but when you add all the modifiers which we'll we'll get into that it it actually becomes a little more complex to figure out what your skill actually is at that point in time depending on the actions that you're taking the modifiers you're applying the difficulty of the test Yep. be adding 30 but then subtracting 15 you know yeah. like so it gets interesting but i didn't think yeah, it think, was too bad but i think again yeah. to your point earlier jody this is not a beginner game and i'm not a beginner role player either so like i was right. able to adjust yeah. pretty quickly yeah it's yeah, got a, it, a slight learning curve but i think you'll adapt to it pretty quickly right and and once you look at the way the modifiers are parsed out that it's it's either somewhere between plus 30 of benefit down to a minus 30 of of difficulty but really those are in 10 point steps right so and it the the rule book actually does a really nice job of going 
during a round of combat, these are the actions you could possibly take. And there's a really lengthy and interesting list of combinations of things you can do. And then it, there's a separate table that goes, here's the modifiers. And it makes yeah. it really clear where you're not having to do a lot of like iffy judgment calling right. on yeah. whether something is, you know. There's some great term. examples of what those modifiers are too. Yeah, it, they really, really do. Well. For, for a pretty granular and, and detail oriented system, it, it, I agree, Josh, that like you're going to pick them up pretty darn fast. Like, I think I felt like by the end of our relatively brief session, we were, you know, oh, so it'd be this, this and this. Hey, Carl, can I get a plus 10 on that? Yeah, that sounds reasonable. No, that's right. not going to work. Okay, cool. And and on we'd go. And it was yep. pretty easy. It exactly. reminds me of Adeptus Titanicus. You look at it, you kind of go, oh, this is going to be complicated. Difficult. But then it's and then not. you play it yeah. one time, you go, oh, I got it. This is good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Josh, no, it's no. not coming. Just because uh, Josh White likes Wolf. to read stereo instructions. <laughs> Don, you mentioned uh, Fate, White Wolf. I think anybody who played White Wolf games, Dice pools, a yeah. lot of this will feel really, really familiar. And I'm not even somebody who played a lot of White Wolf. My wife's the, the expert in that realm. But, you know, the notion of there's even a dots thing with your stats as you advance. Right. That, like It, it yep. really, really borrows a lot of those kind of core white wolf mechanics which is why i was like why can't we just roll d10s for these but and you could i think i really do think you could streamline that but. you could oh uh, but no because never mind we're combat we'll get there yeah, combat. yeah, yeah. so uh yeah and most of these skills fall under you know what you would expect from a skill-based system you know charm driving demolition you know literacy you know uh search silent, like silent move yeah all those all the kind of standards are are there and then it moves into talents. And for those who are familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, especially third edition 3.5, talents are kind of your feats. They're like the things yeah. that separate you from the ordinary uh, individual. And there are little more powerful abilities um, that give that usually have some kind of prerequisites. So what I mean by that is, for example, uh, the talent of gunslinger uh, requires a ballistic skill of 40. So you've already spent a bunch of points in ballistic skill and uh, you know, it's a, and it requires uh, the skill two weapon wielder. And then at this point you're, you've trained with pistols so long that they're like extensions of your own body, barely requiring conscious thought to aim and fire. And when armed with two pistols, you reduce the penalty for two weapon fighting uh, by 10 because there's normally a penalty of of, uh, of uh, 20 I believe and uh, he also possesses the ambidextrous talent talent at that point the penalty is now reduced to zero so you know now you've you have these abilities that make you much more effective um, and there's a huge host of these types of abilities that are all dependent upon kind of your character career yeah, I think it's nice because it helps you really kind of create your own your own thing. You, it's it's really really unique. You can really get into the details. Here's yeah, another. Really able to get a lot of personality in your character. Yeah, here's yeah. another they're perfect gonna, example, right? Play how they hate yep. hatred. Uh, a group, organization, or race has wronged the explorer and is fueling their animosity. And when fighting opponents of that group in close combat, you gain a plus ten to all weapon skill tests against them. So you could pick psychers, you could pick mutants, you could pick orcs. You know, it's kind of a hated enemy type of type of thing yeah, i had a hatred merchant so i was kind of w hoping we would kind of <laughs> get to use that that's funny i wonder if the rogue trader is considered a merchant <laughs> well, i was thinking about those guys we were dealing with before the tunnels you know yeah we were doing, doing deals with them oh, yeah man. by the end of the game you probably did have a hatred of uh jody's rogue trader anyways <laughs> <laughs> he was a loyal she was that's a loyal all right loyal. i didn't have a leg to stand on it was fine <laughs> oh but it's nice no, you had a leg to see though. i had a leg to stand <laughs> a -leg on, yeah. just the one. by the end of the um, game uh, and and so combat is really based on all these skill systems right shooting right. and dodging are all skills that you acquire and uh you know hey i want to swing my sword well what's your you know skill in swords right and okay so great i roll my my attack it succeeds i try to dodge does your success level out you know outstrip my dodge level of success or failure yeah. uh if so you hit you cause damage which is deferred by armor and body type and then you take damage and I, I thought that was a really neat way <clears throat> for the opposed test to work just the degrees of success for yeah. a reaction to avoid dodging specifically was it was pretty elegant and easy to calculate agreed and i also like the way that they do the armor and the damage in this game where they have a set chart so you know depending on what you roll it depends on where you where you hit and mm -hmm. like you may have a carapace chest piece but you may not have any arm armor 
where you may not be wearing a helmet. Right. So your armor's not the same over your whole body. So that was kind of cool. Um, and then and it, it is interesting, that though, it harder the, if you were to target a certain the, body your part. attack. Uh, you roll the percentile dice, and then you reverse those percentile dice for the location. Right. Makes for a very interesting mechanic. I don't know what that adds, like, mathematically or not, to how often am I hitting this location. It makes it really hard to get a headshot. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think this is one of those areas where, and, and I, it, the original Warhammer Fantasy roleplay game had this exact mm-hmm. same mechanic of you roll the percentiles and reverse them, and that's oh, okay. where you, you hit somebody on their body location. For me, that was the first time I was exposed to that that notion. Um, you know, this is one of those things I think as a GM, you could, for the players leaving it intact, because I agree, Adon, that like it really allows this customization. If I'm wearing body armor but not leg armor, and I'm wearing a helmet or I'm not wearing a helmet, and all those kind of things are fun. But when you're shooting, you know, an orc or a mutant or whatever, there's a level of of slowdown there that yeah, I, yeah. I do find a little cumbersome. That I'm like, man, can I just shoot the the guy across? Like it, it gets in the way. It's funny as as much as it's intended to be like cinematic of like you know exactly where you shot the guy and he fell down and this and that. Like it it ends up especially because these characters are you know representing an entire starship and a mass combat and all this stuff. I don't need that level of detail. I did find that to be, you know, when we were dealing with the mutants that we could have just wiped them out, became pretty clear, pretty quick. Or, mm-hmm. you know, when we, you know, we're getting lucky enough with the Necrons to take them down. I don't know how much I really needed that level of detail, but when as a character I'm getting hit, I find yeah. that really yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think well, that's one of those things that as a GM, again, you could, there's a lot because there's so much here. I would encourage GMs to, to pick and choose do you need every little knob and dial to be turning all the agree. time or, or can you cut some things? And it was kind of nice with the Necrons that, because the Necrons had the same armor across their whole body. So it was just like, I don't, right. I don't care where you hit the guy. Yeah, right. And, and, and that's what sometimes. I was going to say. It seemed like a lot of the baddies just had the same armor everywhere. I think that was but, specific to the Necrons though. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, I mean, that, that's the easy way to do it, right? There's just the, the yeah. same armor, the whole thing. So. Yeah. You just that average it out. And, yeah. And, and, and that, to that exact point, I think it makes a lot of sense for characters, player characters, but also like bigger bad guy encounters. Like Exactly. You can actually yeah. get more granular and it gets more interesting that way. Agreed. Uh, a quick, quick thing to mention on the rules is it does have a segment of the rules that is designed specifically for a mass battle system. Yeah. So if you are having that encounter and you've brought 50 guys to support you. you. 50 yeah. dudes with you. Yeah, there, there's a rule to streamline that and make that combat go pretty quick and effective. Yeah, it's called 40K. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, oh, it's way that. faster. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> They're done by the time you've set up your 40K. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about character advancement because this is a very unique way, I think, of, of doing it. Um, in, in games like Dungeons and Dragons, you acquire experience points. And as you reach, uh, as you gain 2,000 experience points, you are now second level. And at 4,000 experience points, you're third level. And okay, you get the uh, commiserate choices at that level. Here, you actually gain experience and then spend that experience to gain additional skills and talents. Um, meanwhile, you still make a level. There's a lot of record keeping that goes on with this particular mechanic. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that it's kind of best of both, you know, in Call of Cthulhu and uh, unless I'm mistaken, again, White Wolf style games, it's this very small kind of incremental increases that just kind of naturally occur as you go along. Uh, Whereas in D&D, like you mentioned, it's just these threshold points. Like you hit this point, cross the threshold, you're better now. This is somewhere in between, which I found really fascinating that, you know, you collect the experience points. That's always kind of this ubiquitous thing in all of role playing. You get experience points. But then you're spending them to improve your character, but right. then you track that. And once you've spent a certain number, you cross to a new threshold level. or level. Yeah. Um, the level is not a, really that big of a deal for the most part. Except it opens up new skills and talents right. that you can buy right. that you right. couldn't buy at all. It's a before. prerequisite for certain right. things. But right. and, and, and by the way, certain skills and talents are, as I mentioned before, have prerequisites as well. So if you're like, well, I really want to be that gunfighter. Well, you know, you're going to have to spend the experience to get this ability before you can spend the experience to get that ability. Right. Which and I what's like. cool that yeah, I, really I do like actually like the granularity of it is that the skills cost different amounts for different characters. Yes. Yes. Like when you get into your, I believe they call it a, a career path, right? Yes. That if you look at the the rogue trader versus the arch militant, they might both have a sword mastery skill, but it's going to cost them different amounts to buy it because yeah. 
they'd have different familiarity with those, which, things, I, like. which I thought I like was a nice a touch. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's three ways you can improve your character. I'll kind of rattle through them real quick here. Yep. You can advance a statistic mm -hmm. uh, by in increments of 5%. So at a, And it maxes out at 20%. So you can increase your statistic. This is those dots I mentioned. You have four yep. dots in something. Maximum well, you've maxed it out. That's, right. that's your maximum potential. Um, you can buy skills or talents, as we talked about earlier, You know, and you can aim improve some of them some of them level up and then some of them are just one-time buys and then again it's the you know well once you've spent a certain level of points new trees kind of open up actually you know what this reminds me of diablo mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. a lot like diablo that that's an interesting times, comparison new pathways start opening up to you and you kind of have to plan when am i gonna which pathway am i gonna follow um i don't know you have to but you probably would want to some it's and funny then, you say that because ross watson had a lot of experience in the video game uh industry yeah interesting yeah this does have a lot of those uh those little click boxes going on in it yeah. um and then lastly and i love that they call this out really specifically in that section is the gm if something's going on and you've spent a bunch of time on a particular planet or this or that the gm as always has that prerogative to just go you know what you have this skill now and or you gain yeah. a rank in this skill yeah. or whatever it may be or gain I'll training in it which we didn't didn't cover but yeah right well i was just going to go there josh talk about that well, you were going there. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that idea that a skill you like, you can know it and then it can get better as opposed to just being a raw percentage. Right. Right. Yeah. This is just mechanically you have a, if you, there you have a basic skill, you're only using half your stat of what you're rolling against for that skill. But if you're actually trained in it, you're using that full skill ability and then you can actually have advancements above and beyond that. Yeah. Which is, yeah. It's neat. It, you know, it, what what is your character familiar with it it just again makes it feel a little bit more characterful yeah yeah and then the last thing i don't i didn't see it on the list but the last thing that it has that i like is it has these fate points mm. that you can use yeah um which we pretty much fate... abuse in a one shot <laughs> oh yeah well you, you always do in a one shot but i like fate points because it allows you to kind of cheat kind of i mean you can do rerolls you can do other things with it it's it, you can do it kind of like um, it's a fairly common mechanic in a lot of role playing games, yeah. you know. Here's... Yeah, yeah, but you can you can burn a, a fate point. Like if you have a base of three fate points, you can like burn it to make it. You only have a base of two in order to not die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When you're bleeding out from a leg wound. Yeah. So really quickly, uh, I'm just going to move on to kind of the equipment list here. I think the thing that's really cool is that if you are um, if you are a fan of Warhammer 40k, you're going to see a lot of equipment here that you recognize. You know what you can get. Yeah. Power swords, power fists, power corgis in my office. Um, you know, uh, uh, a lot of things that you're going to expect to see. Uh, even Harlequin's kisses, orc choppas, that kind of thing. Different types of armor. It's yeah. all here. It's a very robust equipment list in the base book, and it gets Different even. Different patterns, it gets, bolters. Yeah, and it gets added to uh, even further in in. Um, further supplements. So it's, it's quite, quite good. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about psychic powers before the break. Josh, you were kind of our psychic power expert going into the game. Uh, explain yeah. how they work a little bit. Um, yeah. So psychic powers, you're generally uh, making a willpower test. Some of powers might be off a of different stat, depending um, there, there's kind of two things you can do to psychic powers. One is you can do what's called an invocation, which is you kind of spend your first action doing a focus. So then you get a big bonus to when you're actually casting your power. Uh, and when you actually go to cast a power, it's interesting because you cast a power in kind of a, a number of ranks. So your psyker has a psychic level. Like my, my psyker was a level two psyker. So yeah, I was yeah. casting it at level two, but then there's a there's an option where you can push your your power. So I guess there's there's three there's three levels that you can cast a a psychic power at. The first one is um, it's super easy. So there's kind of there's no risk of any kind of um, perils of the warp or any psychic phenomena occurring, and it's it's just kind of a baseline cast of that power. Then there's the kind of standard issue one where there's a little chance if you roll doubles on your your willpower test that you're going to roll on the psychic phenomenon table and see what happens. But then there's this push mechanic, which is like you're really drawing from the warp at that case, and you can bump your psychic level by up to you know three, three or four depending if you're if you're a um, a rogue psyker for example, you can actually push your luck your level up to four, um, and the 
if you if you push, you're a guaranteed to get some sort of psychic phenomena. Yeah. To occur, which has just cool little side effects of the warp influencing the surroundings of the character. Frost building uh, up on glasses. Yeah, and, frost yeah. showing up, lights turning off, robots shutting down. All the spooky stuff. All the spooky stuff. And on that chart, it's a, I think it's a 75 and a beyond is a um, perils of the warp where things really go wrong for you. So it's a 70, it's a 25% chance every single time you cast a power. At, at that kind of push level that something's going to go really wrong for you. Yeah. So there's this pretty, pretty big balance of risk and reward, which I think they did a good job of. Yeah. And powers are pretty neat. Um, I obviously in a, uh, a longer term campaign, we'd see much more use for them than what we had in this game, but the, the range of powers, it's got all the disciplines in there, telepathy, telekinesis, you know, you name it. Um, they, they've got a tree for it and it's pretty, pretty neat. Very cool. All right. So um, the thing I like the most about psychic powers in this is that, um, and this is one of my frustrations recently, I made a post in our like little private group about um, some of my frustrations with Dungeons and Dragons at the time is, is using psychic powers is actually pretty dangerous. Um, it's, it, there's a huge risk versus huge reward type, type mechanic. I think it works out really, really well um, just for, the notes in D and D uh, casting a spell is pretty much just another type of science. It's just another type of attack. You cast it. There's no real drawback or anything um, here. You're effectively casting a psychic power, but you're much like 40 K, you know, you're taking a risk every time you cast it yeah, uh, and it could go, could go bad. Yeah. So let's do this. Let's take a short break. We'll come back and uh, we'll cut, we'll complete our coverage uh, of this. We've got a number of topics. I still want to talk about. Hey guys. I'm Caleb. And this is Kat. And, and we, we are, are CK, CK Studios. Studios. We want to invite you and your friends to come paint with us at one of our exciting and fun-filled Airbrush and Hobby Weekenders. Our weekend workshops are two days of intense hands-on training, working directly with and learning from some of the top gaming artists in the industry. Whether you're brand new to miniature painting or an experienced veteran that wants to up your game, CK Studios has the workshop for you. Our workshops cover everything from learning the basics and building confidence in airbrushing all the way up to creating that centerpiece model for your army or display case. For more class info and our upcoming schedule, you can find us on Facebook at CK Studios Come Paint With Us or register directly at ckstudios.bigcartel.com. If you can't find a class near you, that's okay. Just contact us and we'll bring a workshop to you. All right, and we're back. We're continuing our coverage around Rogue Trader, the role-playing game. Um, next up kind of comes uh, what you would expect uh, a Rogue Trader to have is starships. Um, so no. we have uh, we have actually quite a list of, of starships uh, that you, um, you can gain, you start with, you can purchase. Ultimately, I mean, you could theoretically have more than one at, at, at a given point. Uh, under your command as as a rogue trader, um, <clears throat> that's how you know individual wealth doesn't matter. You're just hey, which starship do I want to take on this? Yeah, excursion? I'll just back <laughs> back it out of the garage. <laughs> um, you know the interesting thing is there is a lot of ships here. There is in in 40k lore there is a lot of classifications for starships from large battle cruisers to carriers to all kinds of stuff uh here it really focuses around ships that rogue traders would use although there's battleships in 40k they're not really included in the core rules because they're so rare and kind of outside the reach of all but the most successful rogue traders that they don't really feel like this is not the focus of the game which kind of leads me to um one of the problems now again there's rules for not only um you know, buying kind of stock ships, but also for creating ships and modifying ships. There's all kinds of things you can add to a ship, which give it various bonuses and drawbacks and that kind of thing. But one, like one a whole of, different rabbit hole you can end up going down. Yeah, but one of the problems I have uh, with this in particular is that starship combat is just so uh, final and super defining, um, because usually the loser of a starship, you know, combat is destroyed, and so now what? you know, great. The whole party's wiped out. <laughs> you know? um, so 
uh, the fate points actually had a very specific mechanic in that every yeah. single player on that ship has to spend a fate point and then the gm finds some cool narrative way for them to limp off yeah otherwise everybody's dead exactly right and it really does boil down to yeah i mean you could wipe out the whole group with this i mean like i think like i wrote in my thing like space combat is always super cool in movies right and star mm-hmm. trek continuing that kind of narrative like it's always really cool to see the enterprise in combat with you know whatever uh in the next generation like the battle against the borg was really a really cool scene to see you're not really seeing all the ships that are being destroyed you know you are but what if picard was on one of those ships and he's destroyed i mean that's the end of you know that's the end of the story so uh it, it does have a sense of finality to it that becomes very hard in my mind to kind of play around it's grimdark. It so, is. So, so, oh, go ahead. I was going to say one of the things, though, is is it doesn't have to be. Um, uh, fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons, which I completely missed. I I have that never happened. You're so for lucky. Me. Uh, no, that's I what like I hear. It. I know it's it's oh, like very it. it's very divisive. People either really like it or don't. But one of the things they introduced in that edition is I've kind of come back and and really been enjoying learning about all the different permutations that Dungeons and Dragons have gone through since my days playing a lot is that this idea of, of skill challenges where everybody on the ship, and we talked earlier about how everybody could have a different role on the ship, and everybody's going to kick in a different skill challenge. Mm-hmm. And then it could be to you know make a run through an asteroid belt. And then depending on how well each person did and how many successes they generated as a collective group, then the GM could arbitrate that with thinking of it in degrees of success or degrees of failure. Um, Certainly the combat though could be the same thing. Are you outrunning somebody? Are they trying to outrun you? How do those degrees of success and failure focusing on, I guess as as the GM, we're going to start here and we are going to end here, but how we get from point A to point B during this ship encounter, the ship to ship encounter, Mm -hmm. that's all the variables. And I mean, that's kind of true of any encounter as a GM, right? You're looking at, we're going to start here and we're going to end hopefully somewhere in this set of variables. And your condition when you get there is what's going to be the difference. Right. And, and looking at it that way, I think there's a lot of room for play. Um, It's just, it is such an interesting idea and unfortunately the least interesting idea with for me the least interesting idea especially is like thinking of this from a gm point of view yeah of anything that is ship to ship is combat ships two ships fighting each other i agree with you carl is going to be the least interesting thing that could possibly happen and partly because the stakes are going to be so high yeah but then a boarding action could be fascinating if you right. launch onto an opposing ship. But then it's not really ship to ship anymore, is it? Right. Right. Like, so it's this weird, that was where I went with this is like trying to think about this weird ship to ship problem. There's a lot of, that, of, there's a lot of narrative ways to spin this where it's exciting. You yes. Know? And, and, and I think, so I think rules for ship to ship combat. Great. I'll go play Battlefleet Gothic. Right. Yep. But I understand why they're in the book. But at the same time, as I said, you know, it's the, like you said, the stakes are so high at this point. It's like, OK, um, <clears throat> now one of the things you could do is, as Don mentioned, you know, it's what condition you get there. And then what does that impact for your your, you know, your costs or your expenses right. or, or how does that impact your um, uh, profit factor? Right. right. I mean, if you're taking all this right. damage and you limp into harbor, you're going to have to spend a ton of resources and 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 uh, clout and everything to to get the ship repaired. You're showing up at a system with a beat up ship and you've got less reputation because of for that. sure. Right. You're like, oh, who's I mean, guy? that's very interesting to me. But sure. uh, the rules is as they are like, yeah, OK, we can all spin this. And then the GM narratively describes some way you escape. It's like, OK, you know, again. And I just feel like. It's it's very hard to have the threat there of a problem without it being so overwhelming that you're like, well, we run away from everything because the last thing I want to do is get my ship destroyed, <laughs> right? So it just, it's always been a problem for me for games like Traveler and that kind of thing where it's like the whole group is on a ship and if that ship gets destroyed, well, well, that was fun. Let's roll up some new characters and see how things go. Right. And I think it's almost incumbent on the GM to never make those the stakes. Yeah, right. like exactly. The, the ship, yeah. like right. come up with creative and interesting ways to use the ship, but the stake should never be the right. ship might die. Yeah, like, right. 
which that, also that, runs into the problem of people not feeling threatened where I think you can kind of balance that with damage that costs you like it costs, sure. you know, Hey, costs you goals, costs you, you know, you show up and you're supposed to impress these people, but your ship is leaking fuel everywhere. <laughs> not so impressive. Right. Exactly. I, think, I, I think Jody's idea where, you know, you encounter this enemy ship. Now everybody does skill tests and depending on the levels of success or failure, that tells you yep. what you're, how you look when you, when you finish. Yeah, absolutely. And that does have, that, there are those factors in here. I love the idea of boarding actions and trying to repel yeah. borders oh, yeah. and that kind of stuff. It's all very exciting. Um, you just got to be real cautious with it is, is my point. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the, I guess my point is the key of your game is never going to be, let's go get out and ship to ship combat fights all the time. It'd be very short lived games. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, you have, yeah, it's, I think any de- any reasonably experienced player, exactly as you said, is going to be, there's actually no, you're going to have plot armor as they call it. Right. The, exactly. Like, the GM isn't actually right. going to kill us. Um, yeah. yeah. Which is a, is a level of, I guess I would say I'm almost guilty of as a character that I immediately assume I don't have it, but then I'm always testing to find out if I do, you know, <laughs> that is the like, no, I want to play a character that's going to get involved and do things. And then, you know, when I'm like, I go and run on, jump off the bridge and jump for that rope. And I, oh, I rolled really bad. I'm okay with having a new character. And the GM's like, no, you get, you grab the thing. The yeah. thing. And I'm like, oh, well, there's no threat here. And it's actually, I don't, then push that i'm just bored now because yeah there's no threat well don't worry about that in horror on the orient express i got <laughs> I knew, you I, I know I'm that already, game well enough. i'm already telling people you might want to come with a second character <laughs> start planning your next character <laughs> <clears throat> um okay so then uh the coronas expanse this is a very interesting um area so every game that has come out uh under this the five games that have come out under this all take a certain sector of space and kind of call it their own and develop it. And for Rogue Trader, that's really uh, the Coronas Expanse, which borders on the Calixis sector, which is where um, uh, Dark Heresy takes place. Right. And uh, the only way into the Coronas Expanse is through this thing called the Coronas Passage, which is the uh, a safe passage through these warp storms from the Calixis sector into the Coronas Expanse, which is, um, and because of those warp storms, that makes this area uh, very um, less traveled. It's kind of wild. You're out in the wild. So like if you were going to compare it, to, again, I'll go to a Dungeons and Dragons analogy. Uh, you are away from society, away from civilization, and exploring the wilds of, of the land. Uh, and that's what the Coronas Expanse really represents. Now, other aliens may have civilizations in that area, and there are. Um, but one of the things I really appreciate about this area, is, and it's a fairly large area they're covering, is they don't go into a tremendous amount of detail about every single world in that area, which in the uh, Calixis sector, there's a w- way more detail about every small world. Here, it's really painted with broad strokes, kind of how the rest of the game is. Uh, you have these broad strokes of here's kind of what's in this area and here's kind of what's in this area and here's where some of the Eldar are and the orcs are maybe parading around here. Um, and it, it really does evoke this sense of you are out on the fringes of of society. And uh, I love it. The other thing they do, my you know, one of the problems with shelter in place is my dog... Uh, seems to be staying out here with me right now and is making a lot of noise. Um, one of the um, really interesting things here is there's a massive space station, void station called Port Wander, uh, which adventures can take place in, but also it kind of is at the gateway to the Kronos Expanse. So a lot of kind of adventures would maybe launch from this area or even take place in it. And it's just a, it's a pretty well detailed um a piece of of architecture in the world or in the system, and it's so is it pretty like exciting. A tavern where everybody starts, they meet at the. If the, the tavern, tavern is the size of a planet, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty big. The Freeport for those who, yeah, the D and D Freeport, right? It's, there you go. The, the wretched hive of skull and villainy, or the noble palace, or exactly. Yeah. It's all yeah. the things. It's all all of the things. Yeah, it's a city yeah. that you can start from. Uh, and then, um, in addition to this, I mean, this game was incredibly well supported. Uh, there were a ton of uh, resources that came out and um, just starting with the Game Master's Kit, uh, which 
uh, was a screen for Rogue Trader that had a booklet with a pre-written adventure in it and NPC starship generator and star system generator. Lure of the Expanse, which was a source book that contained three adventures in it, kind of separate, but you could tie them together. Uh, Forsaken Bounty was like they released. The other thing they released was a ton of free preview stuff, like preview adventures. That was what we played was actually one of these adventures. Right. Um, so all of these were to they they were in not only trying to get people into the game, but they were supporting it for free in some aspects as well. Dark Frontier, a free preview adventure um, that you could download from Fantasy Flight at the time. Now all these are available. Uh, sometimes you know these things are for free on Drive Through RPG. Um, into the Storm, which was a source book for rules about creating aliens or Xenos player characters. So uh, the Kroot and Orc species, there were vehicles and gear in there. Edge of the Abyss, which was uh, a source book, uh, which detailed out more descriptions of the Coronis Expanse at that point. So they got a little more detailed there. Um, and then there was a kind of um, what Pathfinder players would call a um, adventure path. There was yeah. kind of a series for that that was three different. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry, my dog's making noise. She's got to stay in here. There were three different uh, uh, scenarios the Frozen Reaches, Citadel of Skulls, and Fallen Suns, which were all part of this thing called the Warp Storm Trilogy campaign. And that would, that would keep you busy for years. Uh, it was so, there was so much detail in it. Uh, Battlefleet Coronas added more starships and talked about the history of the Imperial Navy a bit. And again, the source material here is all kind of vetted and really, really interesting to, to read. Um, Hostile Acquisitions, which was a supplement on expanding career paths um, for, for all the characters uh, and adding new ones. Uh, the Coronas Bestiary, which is kind of like the monster manual of, of the system. And that's actually a great, great book as well. Um, and it went everything from aliens to demons to, you know, hostile Xenos, the whole thing. Um, Soul, the Soul Reaver, which was a source book on Dark Eldar in the Coronas Expanse. Um, again, you, uh, you get a deep look into the lore and everything there. So it's, um, there's just nice little tidbits in that that can add to everything that you're, uh, you're already familiar with and just add some flavor and color there. Uh, there's the Navis Primer, which is a source book uh, covering warp-related aspects of the game and with an emphasis on the the psychers, the astropaths, and the navigators. <laughs> and, Josh. and then uh, uh, there's supplements around, more supplements around the world of, of the Kronos Expanse. And then finally, Faith and Coin, which was something that uh, focused on explorers and the ecclesiarchy. And th that was kind of where the system ended. Like, it... it, it lost support by the time that thing came out but that is a lot of source books and yeah, that's a lot a, of material yeah. <laughs> very few rpgs well i don't know about very few i feel like anymore that's kind of the the model for a successful rpg but that's what they look like is yeah a giant stack of books and, and let me tell you these pack. are hardback books they are all fairly thick for the most part uh, the the some are a little thinner than others but my shelf contains most of these <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. My shelf contains most of these, and I have to put them on the bottom shelf because the wood of the top shelves will bow and, and bend. Yeah, I'll say well, it's it's really neat to see how they uh, expanded the existing roles and territories. Yeah, to to round out things a bit more with each of these expansions, but then also added new options. Like, yeah. yeah, I think they, they really did a good job of covering the bases. If you can pick this stuff board. up on a humble bundle or something like that, not only it's more than you're ever going to read. It's yeah. literally more than you're ever going to read. And, uh, it, and it, the quality of the writing, the quality of, of the presentation, all of it is top notch, just top notch. I'm Wait. super bummed that they don't produce this game anymore. You know, with a fantasy flight product <clears throat> that you're going to get, yeah, if nothing quality. else, it's going to look beautiful it's going right. to be incredibly well produced and and we're certainly seeing that here i mean even just the the pdf version i was working with was yeah fantastic it was absolutely beautifully put together and well thought through and it's pretty rare that fantasy fly is a misfire in that regard so yeah. yeah yeah it's neat to see all the extra stuff they brought in instantly i have so many questions <laughs> <laughs> so um okay let's do this let's uh let's take a short break we'll come back we'll kind of give our final thoughts on this and then we'll close out the show Sound good? Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. 
right. So thank you for joining us for episode 207 of the Independent Characters. Again, I apologize for how late it is. We were just getting back on track when things got thrown off track again. But uh, hopefully we are going to be back on track here very shortly. Um, that being said, what are your guys' kind of final thoughts around the game? Uh, that Not only the one we played, but kind of the potential of the system. Two things really jump to mind for me. And the first one is that that keeping in mind that this is a skill-based system. And I feel like no matter which role-playing game you're talking about, no matter which game you know, which set of rules are going to use to, to arbitrate your imagination and, and playing make-believe together, they always have drawbacks. And, and I'd say, to be fair, this one's drawback and its strength, which is usually the case with skill systems, is there's that level of granularity, right? That, that you got to want to do that. Um, right. It's not an unpleasant level of it. I've certainly played other role-playing games where I felt like that was a hindrance to me getting to, to do my imagination time with my friends. But there's a lot of it, you know, there, the, it, it, this is a game that really a, a two or three page player aid would be tremendously helpful mm-hmm. to have a mm-hmm. reference sheet in front of you while you're playing that your character sheet is effectively, you know, four or five pages, but some of them are just reference pages. The second thing though, that maybe on a little bit more positive spin is, you know, the great strength to me of Rogue Trader is that it allows you access to everything that as players and GM, you can go anywhere. You can look at anything. I mean, even if you just stay in the Cronus expanse, you can experience orcs and demons and Eldar, and you can talk to planetary governors. You can get in a you know gunfight or barter session with mutants in a trench. You can see Necrons. You can, yeah. you know what I mean? Like everything that is 40K is at your fingertips. And I don't know that without some kind of shoehorning and and hand waving and and explaining a way of things that the other games are going to allow that no, as much um whereas here you want to do a political game do a political game yeah. you want to do a wild west kind of game do that you want to do a dungeon crawl do a dungeon yeah. crawl yeah. that really everything that is the amazing variety that is 40k you know, or the 41st millennium is all right there for you in playing rogue trader. I mean, frankly, of all of them, and I mean, this is the only one I've played, but I'm aware of, of what all of them thematically are offering. Mm -hmm. This is the only one I'm really interested in playing. Like this is the one that I go like, no, this is what I want to play or run because I don't ever go, you know, Carl, you talked to recently, you you were playing some more Hammer Fantasy Roleplay, and it was always one of the problems of like, yeah, but I don't get to do the stuff that I'm playing on the tabletop game. I'm stuck <laughs> down on the streets of Marienburg chasing rats. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. this this doesn't have that problem. And it does it in a way that doesn't feel ham-fisted or forced. It feels very natural that I have access to the whole 41st millennium. And I think that's just like, that's what I would, if I was going to play a 40K role-playing game, that's what I want. Right, 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 right. right. Okay. Adon, what are your thoughts? Well, I played in a Dark Heresy campaign, um, and I played that one shot with y'all with the Death Watch. Yep. And uh, I, I agree with Jody. I think this is my favorite of the systems because of the range of stuff you can do. You can, I mean, it's basically, you can do anything from Blackstone Fortress to Battlefleet Gothic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, nice. mm-hmm. Oh, a Blackstone Fortress would be kind of cool. Pretty much. Um, and so I, I find that to be very, very interesting. Um, when, when Doug started talking about the scale of things that you can do and bringing down, you know, fifty a, a fifty guy you contingent know, of guys, assa- yeah, 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 assault force, whatever. Like, oh, oh, yeah, and things just started clicking over in my brain. And so I, I really like that part. I mean, yeah, you could just roll one d ten. Did you just write that by Chris Rate? <laughs> you clicked over. Yeah, it <laughs> covered my mind. Yes, um, you, yeah, you could just roll one d10. Yeah, but it, it, but the fact that you don't, I think, really helps in this because mm-hmm. of what, the things that you can do. I mean, it's just like in Infinity, you roll d20s, mm. and in 40k, you roll d6s. Mm. But the level of granularity with with Infinity allows you to do a whole bunch of other stuff with way fewer models, right? But it's it unlocks more stuff for you. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing here. You you have a lot more stuff unlocked. And I, I thought it was really interesting. And I, I really like the way you can customize the characters and, uh, and and that kind of stuff. I thought that I, I feel like there's too many skills. Um, I always hate looking down a list of, you know, 100 skills mm-hmm. to kind of figure out what I'm doing. 
I wish they grouped those more, but that's just a common thing for me in, in role playing games. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I like I like a lot of skills in my game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. so it's really just a flavor. It allows you yeah. to really, really customize your folks and, mm-hmm. and really get them to be unique to how you want them to be. So mm-hmm. that, you know, I'll accept that trade off. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Josh. Yeah, I would say um, ha- having a large amount of skills and having that granularity and the various talent trees and things like that brings so much character to this game. Like your characters will really feel like who they are. They do what they do. They do that well. But they're also well-rounded individuals. It's not like D&D where you're the fighter, you just smash stuff. You actually have a pretty diverse skill set of things that you're going to bring to that that are going to complement a specific kind of role in the group, but mm. but you're not kind of sitting around idly in you know situations that aren't what, what your character is really there for. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing I absolutely love about this setting of Rogue Trader is how much it can bring 40K to life. Like it, what I was saying earlier is there's, while Rogue Trader, uh, the notion of a Rogue Trader doesn't really exist in 40k the game right now, aside from now there's that one Kill Team expansion mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. that isn't really playable in any way except for that box set that that was released in. There, there's so many elements of uh, Xenos and interactions and things like that that this game will bring to life that the 40k tabletop experience does not. And that's I think that's point. awesome. It's a great way to explore the lore, the background, the environments, the and just the the grim dark and how much character you can bring into that would be super character characters. The downside of that being is it does, I think, rely a bit more on the GM and the players mm-hmm. to be mm-hmm. a little bit more invested in that background, in that oh, yeah. story. Because uh, if you're not super familiar with how the, the 40k lore works or how, what a rogue trader is about or the scale of things your games are you i mean you're, you're not really tapping into that potential that the system can truly bring to life right i think that's a great point that there's a big ask from this game that it, it, you can't just i don't know anything about any of this stuff and i'm going right. to sit down and play would no. I, I feel like would be a really hollow experience yeah like, you've yeah, got to exactly. be really steeped in the lore to to really right. evoke what what it is you're trying to do right. so if you uh, have somebody who doesn't way. know this setting you'd have to tell them to read a lot of the book <laughs> yeah for sure or they actually get into it i would say you'd have to read more than just this book you would have to really yeah. just reach out to 40k knowledge i mean as you said at the beginning like this is not a game for beginners i, I really don't believe this is a game for beginners um you, you actually have done a lot to change my mind uh just in your final kind of thoughts here because uh for me this is maybe not the experience I was expecting when we when we kind of started out with it. Uh, I mean, I'd read the rules before, but it it the scale and scope of it, um, in terms of as we keep using that Star Trek analogy, right? That, that you're in charge of a much larger group. It's not just your individual that you're wor- you're you're focused on. Um, very few times have I played role playing games where we engage in that kind of thing, where you're engaging in like <clears throat> political theater or you know. Um, negotiations and that kind of thing for a larger organization uh i find like i've had high level dungeons and dragons games to evolve into that but not you know um not a game that kind of starts out like that which i find very very interesting i don't know that it's the game of all the games that i'm like yeah this is the one i would want to play for me i think that's probably dark heresy because i really like the inquisition stuff and it aligns fairly close to like my Cthulhu experience. Yeah, very Call of Cthulhu actually. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my friend Ed, who used to work uh, at GW was the head of customer service for Forge World. Um, he had actually run uh, Masks of Narlathotep as a, as a dark heresy adventure. Like he'd kind of just re jiggered it into yeah. a, you know, situation where, uh, Oh no, it's this planet that you go to not Egypt or whatever. And, and, um, and, he, and it worked very well. Like it just kind of almost dropped right into it. Massive Narlathotep is a massive, uh, massively popular campaign for Call of Cthulhu. For those who don't know, probably one of the most famous and, and popular adventures uh, of all time. Um, so uh, I, I like it. I think again, I think it relies on the right group, the right GM more than ever with this kind of game. But it has so much potential. And I think Josh and Adon, you really sold me on like the. <laughs> you can you can bring in all these elements that the other games do not bring in for example um black crusade is very very i feel like the most confined of all of them um 
though it offers some interesting potential too. And we'll cover that eventually and see how that goes. But it, as much as I love chaos, it's actually the one I'm least interested in playing. So, you know, there you go. There's only so many times the sky can rain blood <laughs> and keep you interested, I think. And skulls. <clears throat> and skulls. But anyway, uh, you know, any other points you guys want to make or should we go ahead and uh, start wrapping up here? I enjoyed the hell out of it. All right. Yeah, it was a good, I'm, I'm glad we played through it and, and gave it a go. Um, so as you know, we have a Facebook group. Um, you're welcome to join that Facebook group. I, it's, it's fantastic. I, we're 5,500 people or something at on at this point. I don't really yeah, something like that. pay attention to that, but um, <clears throat> it continues to be a very strong, uh, positive place in the community that uh, if you are looking for, um, you know, as ninth edition is right around the corner and we're expecting it to come out, as with all uh all oh, things when a new when a new edition comes out there's a whole lot of of angst and 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 uh, uh hatred that goes on you know his i think it's somebody it might have even been jody said nobody nobody hates 40k like 40k fans <laughs> but, yeah you can insert star wars <laughs> yeah. or comic yeah. books yeah. or star trek or and uh yeah. uh you know this is probably a safe harbor for the people who really want to celebrate and get excited about what what's going on uh with ninth edition not that a lot of people aren't it's just this is always a very positive place, space to be uh you can leave us review on itunes we very very much appreciate those um they they do help the show get seen by more people uh and uh we have a patreon if you're interested in that you can find more information on that at the independent characters.com uh, the patreon offers you some uh unique rewards for supporting the show as well i guess that's it so until next time this is carl this is josh this is jody this is a Don. <laughs> and we're coming to you from the Astronomicon where we have boldly gone where no servitor has gone before. And telepathy doesn't work on robots. <laughs> and you can role play however you want. And the void is a harsh mistress. And we will see you next time. This episode of The Independent Characters is protected by the Creative Commons license. If you have further questions as to its use, you can find information on the front page at theindependentcharacters.com.